to public meeting of the San Jose Charter Commission's October 25th to order um, and ask that the clerk take the roll. Barbara Marshman. Ms. Barbara, I see you're there. Uh, you, know, you might have been muted. Would you mind reaffirming your attendance? I apologize. I had trouble with my sound button on the computer. I am here. Yes. Thank you very much. Christina Johnson? Here. Elizabeth Monley? Here. Ellie Matsumura? Enrico Callender? Good evening. Frank Maitsky? Derek Percival? Uh, yes, I'm here. George Sanchez. Hui Tran. Jeremy Barus. Here. Jose Posadas. Here. Lynn Diep. Linda Lazat. Here. Luis Barosio. Here. Magnolia Siegel. Present. Maria Fuentes. Sammy Robledo. Here. Sherry Segura. P. Tran. Present. Tobin Gilman. Here. Veronica Amador. Here. Yong Zhao. Here. Thank you. You have a quorum. Thank you. Tonight we have a study session and we're going to be taking on a number of different topics, um, many of which have come from public comment. Um, so individual commissioners will be um, being able to uh, respond to some of the pieces. And so this study session starts with uh, placing municipal law accountability and inclusion. Um, we're starting tonight's um, first presentation by with um, Joseph Royce from the city auditor's office of the city of San Jose. Um, Following, we're gonna have Robin Rose uh, from the internal auditor manager from the County of Santa Clara, who's running a little bit late, but I know that um, Joseph can start. Um, they each are being assigned 20 minutes and then we will have uh, a 10 minute period of question and answers from commissioners. Um, we have a very full agenda tonight, so I want to uh, keep us on time. So we're gonna get started right now. And so welcome to Joseph uh, and thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you for having me. Let me bring my presentation up. Um, so again, my name is Joe Royce. I'm the city auditor for the city of San Jose. And I, oh, bear with me. Um, quickly run through what I'm gonna talk about tonight. Uh, basically talk a little bit about who we are as uh, the office of the city auditor. Uh, talk about a little bit about what is performance auditing, which is the primary function of our, audits, or, of our office. And then a little bit about our work plan. So the mission of the city office of the city auditor is to independently assess and report on city operations and services. To fulfill this mission, we conduct performance audits that identify ways to strengthen public accountability and improve the efficiency, effectiveness, and equity of government. Section 805 of the city charter outlines the authority and responsibility of the city auditor's office. And I'm going to run through at a high level what those uh, responsibilities are. What's included in the slide is paraphrased from the charter for the sake of brevity, just to let you know that. So we are, uh, we conduct or cause to conduct annual post audits of all the city's fiscal transactions and accounts kept by or for the city, including the examination analysis of fiscal procedures and the examination, uh, checking and verification of accounts and expenditures. So this first bullet refers to the city's financial statements. We contract with an outside financial accounting firm for the financial statement audit work. The current auditors, Macias, Genie, and O'Connell, were selected through a competitive request for proposal process. And our current agreement runs through 2023. In total, there are more than 20 different financial audit projects, including the citywide annual comprehensive financial report, or ACFR, as well as standalone financial statements for the airport, San Jose Clean Energy, South Bay Water Recycling, and others. The next bullet says we conduct city council assigned performance audits to determine whether the city resources are being used in an economical, effective, and efficient manner. Established objectives are being met 
and desired results are being achieved. Performance audits are the focus of the work of staff within the city auditor's office. And I'll discuss what a performance audit is and our processes in a few minutes. We also are tasked with conducting special audits and investigations as assigned by council. We would follow our, our normal performance audit procedures for assignments such as these. On a monthly basis, I report to the city council's rules and open government committee about the work of our office and the status of the projects on our work plan. Lastly, we perform other auditing functions. An example, this is our semi-annual report on open audit recommendations, which I will also describe in a bit. So what is performance auditing? According to the United States Government Accountability Office, who sets the uh, standards for performance auditing or government auditing standards rather, performance audits are engagements that provide objective analysis, findings and conclusions to assist management and those charged with governance and oversight uh, to among other things, improve performance and operations, reduce costs, facilitate decision-making by parties with responsibility to oversee or initiate corrective action and contribute to public accountability. I want to highlight a few things from this, this uh, definition. Objective analysis. So I am directly appointed by the city council. I'm one of five council appointees, including the city manager, the city attorney, myself, the city clerk, and the independent police auditor. We do not report to or supervise by the city manager, nor are we directed by the city manager, nor are we uh, report to any department director. We report directly to city council. Findings, conclusions, findings and conclusions to assist management in those charged with governance and oversight. So this refers to what we learn and report in our audits. This can refer to deficiencies in internal control, non-compliance with policies and procedures, or other problems that we may end up identify in our analyses. Our audit reports also include recommendations for management to address problems or deficiencies. We also present our reports to the city council, who is the body charged with governance and oversight. City Council accepts our reports and the recommendations contained within. Improving performance and operations, reducing costs, facilitating decision making, and contributing to public accountability. So, improving performance and operations and reducing costs, these are pretty straightforward. We make recommendations around efficiencies and operations, improved service delivery, and others. Facilitating decision making. I, I noted before we include recommendations for improvement in our, in our audits. I'll discuss our audit process a bit later, but we work with departments during the course of our audit, talking through the issues to better understand their work, to understand what is doable from a recommendation standpoint, as well as any challenges that they face. Contributing to public accountability, we address this in, in multiple ways. As I said, all our audits are public documents and are posted on our website. We publicly present them at council committees and at full council, at full council meetings. We also address our recommendations to those responsible and accountable for their implementation. And we follow up on all open audit recommendations on a semi-annual basis. We conduct our work in accordance with government auditing standards developed by GAO. And auditing standards, or GAO's auditing standards provide a framework for conducting forms audits based on a few important principles. One is independence. As I noted, I'm directly appointed by council and we're not supervised or directed by the city manager in any way sufficient and appropriate evidence for our findings. So government auditing standards uh, provides a framework which we've incorporated in our internal policy procedures for gathering, documenting, and uh, in questioning internally the evidence that we gather in our findings to ensure that it's sufficient and appropriate to, to, uh, to uh, support the findings and conclusions in all our reports. And public reporting, again, all our reports are public, you can find them on our website, we report them publicly, and uh, all past recommendations you can find on our two uh, uh, recommendation dashboards, which we maintain on our uh, website. So what is performance audit? Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about just the phases of an audit. It starts with, a, uh, the, when we initiate a project, we send out job start letters announcing that we'll be starting a project. We send messages to the city manager's office, the city attorney's office, and the department director over the program under audit. We also send messages to the city council asking if they have any specific concerns in the audit area. We also conduct an entrance conference. This is the opening meeting with the auditee. We'll like discuss the tentative objective, understand who's involved in the program, identify any data that we may need, 
and generally introduce, introduce ourselves and the audit process. We move into the preliminary survey phase where we research the program under audit and identify potential audit issues. Auditors thoroughly research the subjects to be audited. This may include reviewing budgets, contracts, organizational charts, relevant provisions of the city charter, municipal code, or the city administrative policy manual, or other materials such as internal uh, guidelines, interviewing relevant staff and in the program and other work. Next, we move into the risk assessment where auditors identify and prioritize risks associated with the audit areas and also plan the extent of future audit testing that will be included in the next stage, which is the field work stage. The field work stage is the, the stage where auditors really in-depth analysis to address audit objectives. objectives. The audit tests or the, the different sorts of analysis can include observ observing operations, interviewing personnel, examining data, analyzing reports, and really doing different sorts of in-depth analysis to come up with conclusions and findings. Once we complete field work, we write our report, and then we issue an audit report that communicates conclusions, findings, recommendations to the audit entities and to the city council. Even though we've issued a report, we're still not done. After the audit is issued, auditors monitor and track recommendations as part of our recommendation follow-up. We issue semi-annual recommendation status reports that we present to council. We also maintain two dashboards on our website and resolution of past recommendations. This goes back to about 2010. Over the last 10 years, our office has issued 115 auto reports with more than 800 recommendations. About 72% of recommendations of those recommendations have been implemented or closed. The estimated ratio of monetary benefit to audit costs has ranged from $1.18 for every dollar spent from an audit cost to $3.63 to every dollar uh, spent on audit cost over the past few years. Our office has received numerous awards from the Association of Local Government Auditors, ALGA. Uh, these audits have been related to library hours and staffing, the housing department's apartment rent ordinance, the police department's secondary employment unit, and pension sustainability. And one question we often get is who audits the auditors? We are audited every two years by other auditors as part of ALGA's period. And that is also part of government auditing standards. So how are audit subjects chosen? So every year, the city auditor proposes an annual work plan for approval by the city council. The proposed work plan is based on different factors. Uh, including a citywide risk assessment, which helps us prioritize potential audit areas. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Audit requests or recommendations. We get recommendation requests from the city council members. We get recommendations from the administration, uh, employees within the city, as well as residents. Audit coverage across departments. We try to spread our audit work across the city to get a breadth of uh, coverage across the city and departments. Capacity of the office is, of course, concern, is a question that we uh, account for. Uh, we get far more requests than we generally can take in any given year. And lastly, we, uh, in 2020, received council direction regarding frequency of audits for constituent-facing departments. And I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, lastly, additions or changes to the work plan can occur throughout the year based on council requests or other priorities. The process of High, at a high level I've described here, but in more detail is described in the City Administrative Policy Manual, CPM 6.12, Audit Review and Follow-up Procedures, which describes not only our role and our audit process, but also the work plan development process. An example of, of the sorts of projects we take on, um, from our current fiscal year 21-22 work plan, uh, we have two recently issued audits related to code enforcement management and oversight. Uh, and municipal water billing and customer service. These related to the departments of planning, building and code enforcement and the environmental services department respectively. We also have a citywide audit related to procedures for managing federal grant awards. We've been asked to review departments adherence to and implementation of the city's adopted bill of rights for children and youth. Children and youth. This will primarily be related to youth programs and departments of uh, the Department of Parks, Recreation, Neighborhood Services and the library. We're going to review the Public Works Department's administration of the city's wage theft policy, prevention policy. And we've been asked to assess the Police Department's administration of Muni Code, Municipal Code regulations around firearms 
and review trends in firearm violence in the city. Uh, these are just some examples of, to show the breadth of our work across the city, uh, and which is this type of spread across the city is typical of our work plans. One more I was going to mention is that we've been asked to assess progress of the city of city departments uh, adherence to uh, the principles outlined in city council's adopted equity pledge. Again, this is another citywide audit. Our risk assessment, which I have said mentioned before, helps us prioritize work. Uh, audit subjects is based on a number of factors, including proposed expenditures, proposed revenues or estimated revenues, proposed number of staff, whether the service is represented by a city service area dashboard performance measure as identified in the city's operating budget, fund balance, fund type, audit request, data last audit. On this, you'll see that the potential audit subjects on the third column from, from the left are listed at the core service or fund level. A core service refers to a department's key line of business as defined in the city's operating budget. It is at this level the department's budget, their expenditures, and developed programs. For example, the Department of Parks, Recreation, and Neighborhood Services has five different core services community facilities development, community services, parks maintenance and operations, maintenance and operations, recreation services, and strategic support, which encompasses the department's financial and human resource management, public information and support functions. Each city department generally has several core services that are represented in the city's budget, the operating budget in this, and in this spreadsheet. Other factors that are considered in, in the work plan, an audit request can identify smaller programs for review or help identify potential audit objectives. Um, I'll give you an example how that works. Uh, the, our recent audit of municipal water uh, billing and customer service, municipal code, or I'm sorry, the Muni, Muni water had, had risen on our uh, risk assessment because we hadn't audited that area in many years. Uh, but the specific audit objective around billing and customer service actually came from a resident request uh, a couple of years ago who had concerns about billing and customer service. So that's how the two kind of the risk assessment and the request kind of work hand in hand. It helps uh, the, the the fact that we had an audited mean water in a couple of years popped up onto our list from a risk assessment standpoint, and then the request itself uh, helped us really narrow in on what the audit objective would be. Cross departmental functions do not fit neatly into the risk assessment process. This is another piece where we're looking at re requests sometimes help us uh, take on certain uh, subject areas. And this, this could be similar to the, I mentioned the adherence to the principles and the equity pledge. There's no core ser service necessary in the city related to the equity pledge. However, it's, it is uh, uh, an area of focus of the, of the council and of the Office of Rac Racial Equity within the city manager's office. So it's in a cross departmental that we'll be looking at uh, as we move forward or as we, when we take on that audit. The per council direction in 2020, the annual work plan is to include regular performance audits of at least three constituent facing departments. And these departments should be subject of an audit at least every four years. This direction was given in December 2020 based on the recommendation of former council member Lon Dieppe, who is now a commissioner on this commission, I believe. We took that direction and updated the city policy, administ city administrative policy manual, as I mentioned earlier. The, the policy is 6.1.2, audit review and follow -up procedures. And we follow that direction when we, when we develop our work plan. Lastly, additions or changes to the work plan occur throughout the year based on new priorities or changing circumstances. So examples of this. So examples of additions or changes, um, you know, during the spring of 2020, we proposed and the rules committee added audit work related to the risks associated with tracking and documenting COVID related costs. So in fiscal, at the beginning of fiscal year 19, 2019, 2020, we obviously did not have any COVID related audit work on our work plan. Come March of 2020, when the emergency was declared and uh, the city started to uh, respond to the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, we shifted our focus and started looking at how we're tracking and documenting costs to make sure that um, we were documenting the costs such that uh, we could get future reimbursement from FEMA or other federal programs. Uh, we proposed this and the rules committee, the city council's rules committee 
uh, approve that addition. And then we did three audit memos last year related to COVID related uh, subjects, none of which had originally been on our work plan, but we shifted, as I said, to that work during the year uh, with council's uh, direction and approval. Another, another uh, example is in late 2020, a former code inspector was arrested for abusing his former position for personal gain. And the mayor and two council members proposed adding and prioritizing an audit uh, related to code enforcement management oversight. And so that was another one that was, uh, because of changing circumstances, shifted our work plan throughout the year. So that is at a high level uh, what our office does. More information can be found on our website. Uh, it can be my email our office at city.otter at san jose.ca.gov and also follow us on Twitter. I'm happy to answer any questions. I'm going to hold uh, questions until we finish our next speaker. Uh, our next speaker is Robin Rose, who's the internal audit manager for the County of Santa Clara. Um, thank you, Ms. Rose, for joining us this evening. And you have 20 minutes, and I'll start your clock now. She's coming over from the participants to the panel. Sorry, are you able to hear me? Yes, we are. Thank you. Okay, I apologize. Um, I had to come back to the office because we're out of power at home since four o'clock yesterday afternoon. So it's been a little hectic. So I'm just getting, you know, I was in the office a few minutes, but it seems like my camera is not working for some reason. Can you see me or no? No? She we cannot see you. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry about that. I don't know why I have it on start video. And it's um, not wanting to work. This happened to me earlier today. And oh, there we go. <laughs> it's just been a few minutes. Sorry about that. Hi, I'm Robin Rose. I'm the internal audit manager at the County of Santa Clara. And I did prepare a presentation. When I tried to open it, it shows it was corrupted. So it's been one of those days. So luckily, I have a hard copy here in front of me. So I'll go from that. So I, I highly apologize for that. It's been, yeah, the last 24 hours have been insane. So. Thank you very much. So um, I kind of want to piggyback a little bit off of what Joe had, has said about his audits. Um, you know, what we do a little bit here at the county, we have um, 11 FTE or full-time equivalent staff, which include myself, the supervising internal auditors and nine staff. Unfortunately, we do have four vacant positions because two of those positions were newly added in this recent budget and then um, one person retired and another person has moved and as you guys might be aware it's really hard to recruit good talent these days and with there's different competition so we've been struggling in trying to keep up with the demand and our our risk assessment and to kind of um, know a little bit of what we do um, annually we do a comprehensive risk assessment um, our county has 20,000 employees a nine billion dollar budget plus many departments from a hospital to a jail and social services to parks. And so what we try to do is have a quantitative measure of how we want to assign our audits. So with our limited staff, what we do is we have about 1500 functions or programs that are called cost centers that we evaluate every year. And what we'll do is send out a survey to departments first and ask them if there's any areas that they would like us to look at. So that way we know if there's any departmental requests and we can prioritize those depending on the nature especially like for example covid that has been a highly um, you know high high risk area so our county you know if all has to respond as emergency or disaster service workers as emergency um as emergency operation centers in fact myself as well as four other staff members last year were working in the finance section hoping to prepare the response so that did have to pivot our audit plan so we get all excited we have this plan we put a bow on it and then COVID hit and it's 100 for 180 degrees so we had to respond to the latest risk so we already built some of that into our current audit plan because we know that we work very well with our controller treasurer department as far as helping them review um, to make sure that the costs are spent appropriately that they are allocated to the right fund whether it be the cares act or fema so we have that built into 
our, our audit plan on top of doing the more comprehensive risk assessment of the of the 1500 um, cost centers. And from that, we determine which ones are the highest risk. We have high, medium, low, and then what makes our county very unique, we also have management auditors, um, no relation, but they're Harvey Rose uh, management auditors. They report directly to the board of supervisors. And so their agenda is to help the board with whatever, whatever questions they have, and they'll do more um, as you know, going into performance audits, which is a little bit more broad, looking at an operations performance against specific metrics or policies and procedures, um, and looking at it and generally from that perspective, where internal audit, we might take a part of a, a department's program and drill down and be more of a collaborative basis and helping a department with their internal controls and processes and looking at more in a detail level, which is why we kind of audit at the functional level versus at the department level. And um, I report to our county executive, Dr. Smith, as well as the county oper chief operating officer. So it's a dual reporting that way so that way we can remain independent in um, our reporting practices. And the standards that we follow are IIA, which stands for the Institute of Internal Auditors, which is a little bit more narrow focus, uh, broad focus compared to the yellow book standards that um, a lot of other shops do as well, but they both are professional standards. It's just for us, because pre previously we reported to the controller treasurer and we just moved over this past July. So now that puts us higher level in the organization so we can really be independent, not just in appearance, but also or not in just in fact, but in appearance. So it won't feel like we're part of the county. We still are independent and objective from there. And I'll, I think I'll pause from there to see if there's any questions because a lot, pretty much what else that Joe had said is pretty similar to what we do here at the county. Thank you, Ms. Rose. And thank you, Mr. Rose. Um, can we now open it up to commissioners for questions? Question, commissioners, questions for our, either of our two guests or for both our guests? Uh, Commissioner Siegel. I thank you. And I just wanted to thank you for being here today. Thank you both um, taking your time to come here. Um, in terms of, for, for um, Mr. Royce, I don't know why I'm no longer, okay, there we go. In terms of Mr. Royce, um, my question is, I wrote it down and I'm looking for it. Okay, the city council policy of last year, you, you were talking about that. Um, was that for a department-wide performance audit auditing, or did it involve only a portion of each of those departments? That's a great question. So the, the, the direction didn't specify, but the, but the discussion at the Rules Committee when it was first presented by council, or former Councilman Rudiep, that question came up by the Vice Mayor, Vice Mayor Jones, who um, was concerned that a department-wide audit um, is is quite an undertaking, and so it was clarified at the rules committee. It was it was more a program within a department. I'll give you an example why why I say a, a large department wide audit would be quite an undertaking. The the example that's I mean the easiest to see is the environmental service department. It's a, it's a, a a large department had multiple divisions. One division is the regional wastewater facility, uh, which is a, a huge industrial uh, operation that uh, hundreds of millions likely budget operating capital. It has, um, it provides service to basically the South Bay. Uh, it's partly owned with Santa Clara, the city of Santa Clara provides service to some other districts around the region. Um, it heavily uh, regulated uh, from, from a rate payer standpoint. It's, it's subject to Prop 218 at the state level. It obviously has California, it has water, um, you know, it discharges to the bay. So there's a regulatory uh, environment there. The, the residue from the, from, the, from the waste, it needs to be disposed of in, in, a, in a safe manner. Um, um, there's, 
it's a multi-billion dollar uh, facility. So there's large asset management functions. There's backroom functions around operations, or I'm sorry, management of, of staff. There's I, information technology questions. So any one of those could be subject of an audit. And that's just one division of environmental services. Um, they also, uh, a separate division is in grade waste management, which has hundreds of uh, millions of dollars in recycling and garbage contracts. Again, a, a very large uh, division. And that's just another division. They also have South Bay water recycling, which we audited a couple of years ago, uh, a portion of it. Uh, municipal water is another division, which we just didn't, didn't audit related to that. Uh, but again, any one of those, pieces uh, is a large audit in itself. If we were to take on the all of environmental services, and this is why the, the Vice Mayor Jones was concerned about and brought that up from a conversation standpoint is that would be our office for a full year and we wouldn't have any other coverage. Um, and I didn't even mention at least two other divisions of environmental services. And that's just environmental services. PRNS, I mentioned, had five, has five core services, recreation services, uh, parks, maintenance operations. But we try to do, and I mentioned during our risk assessment, we drill down to that core service level and look at our, our audits. Our audits, when would you most recently audit in that area? And then we get coverage over a department over time. For example, PRNS, I mentioned, or Park Recreation Neighborhood Services. Last year, we issued an audit related to park maintenance and operations, which covers that core service. Uh, the year prior, we did an audit related to the Mayor's Gang Prevention Task Force, which is in their uh, community service function or its core service. Uh, prior to that, we did an audit on the Community Center Reuse Program. Now it's the Neighborhood Partnership Program or Neighborhood Partners Program, um, which is how the Recreation Services Division works with nonprofit partners to run services out of a, out of some of their facilities. So over a three-year period, we worked on three separate um, uh, parks. Re PRNS related audits, and that's how we get coverage across the department over time. And then in this current audit, or current year, we have the, uh, the audit related to the Bill of Rights for Children and Youth, which will also address some of the recreation programs. So we get our coverage uh, through taking on, we look at that core service level. And so the, if, if you, if you wanna go look at old, old rules committee, I, I would suggest you look at that, uh, the, rule, the original rules committee uh, a, a video of that conversation between council member, former council member Diab, uh, the vice mayor Jones, and myself. And I don't know if council member or former uh, council member Diab is here. Mm -hmm. I guess not. So that's how. So that that's a long answer to to your question, but it was it was meant to be more at that, not meant to be a full department wide. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Amador. Then Commissioner Zhao, Commissioner Fuentes. And Commissioner Vice Chair Johnson. So Commissioner Amador. Great, thank you. And my question is, um, do you have the system currently in place um, to ensure all parts of the city department get periodically auditing? Yes, between our risk assessment process, which I said that if something doesn't get audited in, in within a one of the risk factors is a most recent audit. And that's why municipal water originally kind of popped up the list because we had an audit in that area for a while, even though we had done audits in the area of environmental services, uh, primarily South Bay water and some of the wastewater facility and some contracting and, and IWM. So we have that system in place to kind of get to, to, to rank them or to uh, bring them up if, they have, if a core service hadn't been audited in a while. Great. And just one last question. Sorry, I might have missed in your presentation. How often do departments get audited or what is that time period? I know you mentioned saying like, that, you know, South, uh, the water yeah, so, wasn't being yeah. audited. Well, from a, departmental stand, from a department, departmental standpoint, the, uh, the direction was that the, the constituent facing departments get audited at least once. A program within a constituent facing department is audited at least once every four years. And that's um, built into our system. It was not a big change. It just, it, it basically memorialized, now it's memorializing policy, what was already uh, happening because the nature of the constituent facing departments is one, there's gonna be more requests in that area. And two, they're usually the larger departments that pop up higher on the list because of estimated revenues, estimated, uh, um, or I'm sorry, estimated expenditures, uh, number of FTE, things of that nature. 
Um, and then at the core service level, um, it, it, it's going to, because of the, the, the nature of the number of core services in the city, it's, sometimes it's going to take a little while to circle back to that. Thank you. Commissioner Zhao. Um, first, uh, thank you for uh, Ms. Rose and Mr. Royce to spend your evening with us. Uh, uh, your work is uh, a most important portion of our accountability of our government. So thank you very much. Um, my question um, is towards, you know, both of you, I understand that um, it seems like we have a risk assessment system in place um, for uh, your um, office to determine um, and recommend um, for a auditing objects or a list of objects. Um, and then after that, can either the supervisor or in San Jose, that's the rules committee, overwrite your recommendation if they want, say, I mean, sometimes they could accept it or not accept it, partially accept it. Could that happen? Jill, did you want me to to answer that on my side? I, I can take it first. And so, are you, I just want to clarify. You're talking about the the work plan. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to go back to the the uh, the charter. So we can only do audits that have been approved by city council. So that was the one of the first slides I had. I'm trying to bring back. Conduct city council assigned performance audits. So we propose the council approves, and they often will ask us to look at different areas, or um, in which case, in just this past year, I brought the work plan to, to council, and they asked us to take on a couple other projects, which involves kind of reshuffling what was on the work plan. So we dropped one and added, well, we added three and only dropped one. So I'm not sure how that worked out, but <laughs> yeah. So ultimately council, it's council's uh, prerogative to, to, to do that. And then I, as I mentioned during the year, things will pop up. Um, well, they'll ask us to take on new projects. Well, direct us, I should say, not ask us, we'll direct us to take on new projects. Thank you, Ms. Rose. Is the situation the similar at uh, county level? It's fairly similar. Our audit plan goes to the Finance Government Operations Committee, which is equivalent to the Audit Committee, where we'll present that. And if there's and if the two commissioners or the two, the two board members who are on that commission have any questions, we'll go through that, and then they can uh, add or remove. Um, some some audits that are on there. Generally, they they favor more of what we do because again they also have their auditor audit team. So whatever they can't cover, um, you know, we don't cover. They can, can be covered in Harvey Roadside because our county is so large. We need more coverage, but we do present that to them for their review and consideration and answer any questions that they have. Thank you, thank you. Um, if I may, I have a, a second part of my question to Mr. Royce. Um, it's a follow-up question to the previous uh, mentioned uh, uh, department constituents facing department. So say if we do audit for a certain portion of the department, so the likely ones, how many of that portion in those big departments there are? Ten, I mean, it, it, it varies. I mean, I said we have 1500 cost centers, you know, which is equivalent to a specific function because the county is so large, I would say about a third of them, you know, to be conservative would be, you know, you know, would be spread out. I mean, the largest would be in the hospital. And then we have our social services agency, which provides general assistance to the public. And then we have other service departments. Um, so for example, we have currently on our audit plan to look at um, I think like a, a categorical aid payments in our social services. And that social services has about, I would say about 800 cost centers alone on that just on I'm sorry 80 cost centers alone and just by looking at that we're looking at maybe 10 of them because we're high risk high dollar amount they haven't been audited in the last they within we be from zero to 10 years the last time they've been audited by us Harvey Rose or external auditor um, change in funding we look at the amount of expenses taking out their salaries and benefits to see if there's been any larger changes other costs associated with that and of course change in management 
and personalities that could that could be weakness because of the the change in um, the change the change in management. So um, you know it could be just one piece of that that we'll look at in one year. You know if we're lucky to have it on our plan, and that'll be one of maybe I think we have about. We have how many? We have um, 40 or so um, high risk areas. Sorry, 32 high risk areas on our audit plan. Yeah. So, Ms. Rose, uh, can you um, let us know, for example, um, any any of those large departments? So, if we um, if every four years we we audit one piece of it, then usually is that ten uh, one tenth of that department or so one twentieth? So I'm just trying to get a concept on how long it takes us to audit to each portion of that department. Got it. Um, that's really good. For us, it's a little bit harder to quantify because, again, we have Harvey Rose as well. So we try to not to cross paths too much. As far as that, you know, we just recently changed our model to doing more program and departmental audit. So that'll be something that we'll take a look at if we've seen. So, for example, um, every five years or so, we want to take a look at um, a department, a larger department we want to see if there's a certain area that we want to look at but it seems to be the last few years we've had a lot of change in priorities for example with covid um we've had to look at um, you know departmental requests we've had we were short staff so we've been a little more conservative on you know how the frequency of when we're able to do the audits we see if we can do that's measurable and that can be attainable just because of our limited resources that is really hard to quantify at this point Thank you, Commissioner Zhao. Commissioner Fuentes. Thank you. Thank you both for being with us tonight. Um, this is, question is just uh, for Mr. Royce. Um, I would like to know, you mentioned uh, pension uh, sustainability. How do you um, audit that? And when was the last time the, the pension sustainability was reviewed? That's a great question. So we did that audit uh, about a decade, a decade ago. Um, and, you know, we monitor it, but they, you know, the, the, they have, uh, their, their own actuaries and they have an internal audit function within the, within the, uh, the office retirement services right now. So it's still a, a huge risk to the city, obviously. And it, it's, it's one thing that we monitor, but we haven't audit for a bit. The, um, part of the one. In thinking through again the, the risk assessment, it's, it, it is a major risk. Um, we're also trying to think ahead of what sort of what where's the value we can provide. And, and right now, the you know a lot of the, the recommendations we made back then, uh, which you know it's it's uh, at a high level, we're about working with the bargaining units to come up with a path forward. Uh, and from that, they created a, a separate tiers for new new employees. We also recommended that the actuarial, uh, uh, they have actuarial audits uh, on a recurring basis, which basically has somebody come in, a second actuary come in and review the their, their, their actuary's work to make sure that the assumptions going into those models are using to forecast the benefits, which get back to how much we're spending. Those still make sense, whether it's the rate of return or how long people are expecting to be living. So that work is still is you know from our past audit that you know that, that those actuarial audits the internal audit function is providing that coverage which kind of takes us back out of it. So it may be something we look at again, but right now uh, finding our place on that uh, with all the other areas of the city that we're asked to look at, it's not really where our priority is right now. Even though it's it's still a huge dollar, you know, we track it in our annual service report, and the amount we're spending is is quite a bit. And um, there's a whole the other thing we're also looking at is what other activities are happening within the city. Uh, and there's a whole task force that's that's been put in place by by the council to kind of look at options for the future. Uh, and they're talking about you know. Uh, pension obligation bonds and some other things. So we're also kind of balancing our work with other uh, policy level work that's happening in the city, which would we be duplicating? Would we be uh, adding to? So we don't have it on our work plan. It's it's something we, we may come back to, but it, right now, based on the other work that's going on and some of the, you know, the implementation of our previous recommendations, 
it's it, it's not on our, our our list right now. Okay, one uh, just a quick follow up question. What is the name of the task force that's reviewing it? Um, shoot, I don't have the name. I okay, could, I, I can. Could, I'm I could sorry. Get that to you. It's uh, um, yeah, I don't. I'll have look for it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. They just okay. did have a, a presentation about some of the findings uh, a couple of weeks back related to pension obligation bonds. So if you found that, you could find some 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 interest or some uh, reference to that. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Commissioner Quintus, uh, Vice Chair Johnson, and then followed by um, Commissioner Gilman, and then back to Commissioner Siegel. Thank you so much, and thank you for sharing your evening with us. Um, so I have a couple questions. My first one is for the both of you. Do both of your offices maintain any kind of relationship with the public? Um, do you do community meetings? Uh, I'll start off with that one first. Our office does not as at, at this moment, but that's actually a really good idea. Um, I think as we start having more audits and we want to be more transparent reporting on our website, you know, that would be a great idea to, to consider. We don't conduct, uh, uh, you know, community meetings, you know, it's something that we've, we've talked about again, it's similar to what Robin said, um, part of it is capacity. We do have a pretty active Twitter, which again is reaching a portion of the population. Uh, we do try to survey uh, the community every year as part of our annual services work. Um, you know, we also solicit uh, uh, audit recommendations. Um, and then I'll get a lot of comments directly from, from residents or questions directly from residents. And so I'll respond in that way. Um, but we don't have a, like a, a set outreach uh, program for the office. Thank you, Mr. Rice. That segues into my next question is, um, does, is the public able to report to you? Yeah, I get, I get recommendations from the public. Um, I don't want to say regularly, but I, I get recommendations from the public. I mentioned the municipal water audit. Uh, the objective of that came from a, a resident request. Um, I, I usually get a handful of resident requests on, on, an, on an annual basis. Uh, sometimes they make it in the work plan, sometimes it takes a while to get there. Um, but but we get we get requests. And then um, sometimes it, I'll, I'll, during a, a, a council committee uh, a presentation or a council presentation, there'll be public comment and sometimes I'll, I'll respond in that way. Uh, for example, there was one individual who brought up some issues at a one of our audits, and I, I reached out to her afterwards because uh, it was it was somebody I knew because they'd reached out to me before. So, I, I will communicate with to the to whoever's uh, requesting an audit from our office or as or is asking for information from our audits. We get that quite a bit as well. And is that the same for your department too, Miss Rose? Um, oh, wait, hold on. Oh. Sorry, somebody must leave you and make sure my staff so I can lock up. Um, with, with us, we have a whistleblower program that we that we have and that where people where well, they will have a team there that will do an assessment of what if it's financial in nature, then they will come to me and you know decide if that is something that our office can take on as well. But there is um, an option for the public to contact our um, county executive or controller's office if they have any questions on audit. Sometimes it's more financial in nature, so it will be something that can be handled through the controller treasurer department or they spot the, the single audit, which is the compliance aspect on federal funds. So that's generally what the inquiries that we have gotten. It's more rare for us to get something that's directed specifically towards us, but just usually us fielding it towards another department, but we do get those public questions. I just want to add, so the city has a whistleblower hotline as well. It's, it's, it's handled by the uh, city manager's office of employee relations. Uh, but the, the director of the Office of Employee Relations briefs me on a quarterly or semi-annual basis on the calls, the types of calls that are coming in. Uh, normally, it's the sort of thing that her, their office would be handling because it's personnel related. But if there's any, you know, anything that would be audit related or could lead to, uh, to a future audit, such as policy violations, things of that nature, they let us know. Uh, so that's another avenue that things come to us. And then my last question is um, for the both of you. Have 
either of you have done an audit on boards and commissions, um, inclusions, effectiveness, and accountabilities. Uh, this is something that we as a commission have spoken a lot about. So I just wanted to see if um, you know this is an area that you've looked into. So that, that's a great question. We did an audit of the office of the city clerk and a lot of the, her the statutory functions within her office a couple of years back. And we didn't, uh, we looked very briefly at the boards and commissions, but really it was more about um, compliance with things like uh, posting of agendas and things of that nature, as opposed to what, what you're describing, or at least what I, what I think I hear you describing. And for the, the county, um, our office has not done um, an audit specifically of a board or a commission um, member at this time. We haven't um, included that, but as far as the inclusion piece that is emerging in the internal audit profession is something that we're considering for the future as far as on the equitable side. Thank you so much. Thank you, Vice Chair Johnson. Uh, Commissioner Gilman. Thank you. Thank you both for uh, the great work that your departments do. Oftentimes, um, activities of the city and the county overlap, augment one another. Sometimes they're coordinated. I'm speaking specifically about things like, like housing, affordable housing, social services, and that type of thing. And my question is, um, does the city, office, uh, city auditor's office and the county auditor's office ever collaborate on joint audits in these kind of areas where there's synergies between the city and the county? That's a great question because it's something that I've, I was asked just recently and it's not something we've done in the past. Uh, and I'm not from an organizational standpoint and how government auditing and standards, how that would um, really fit within government auditing standards. Cause I think, you know, as Robin mentioned, she follows IA guidelines and we follow yellow book guidelines or standards. So it's slightly different. We follow slightly different standards. Um, but there are guidelines within government on standards about using, you know, relying on uh, the, uh, the work of other auditors, which we do in some cases, for example, we'll rely on the financial statement auditors for some of the work we do. Um, but that is, that's an interesting question. Um, and, it, it, and we haven't in the past. Um, it's something I think worth exploring because as you say, as you say, there's so many functions that do overlap. I mentioned the, uh, you mentioned housing, uh, and we did an audit of homeless services a few years back, and, and some of our recommendations were about coordination and communication with the county. We did an audit of the Mayor's Gang Prevention Task Force a couple of years ago, and so much of the work, if you're not familiar with Mayor's Gang Prevention Task Force, a lot of it's, it, a lot of that work was with coordination with uh, the county probation and some of the other offices at the county level. So there's a lot of overlap, as you said, it's, it's, it's an interesting, uh, it's, it's an interesting uh, potential opportunity. I don't know exactly how it would work. I think we'd have to kind of work through the, the, the how, how it would kind of work. Like I said, the, we do follow different standards, so we'd have to uh, navigate that. Yeah, I agree. That's actually a very good idea. It's an emerging way to kind of have some synergy. And we do have trainings that we do together as far as learning what other counties and cities are doing with San Jose, um, Santa Clara County, San Mateo County, and other neighboring counties. We get together and we talk about the different audits because we can always learn from each other. That is something, you know, with um, auditing is like why reinvent the wheel if there's an emerging risk somewhere in one county or city, most likely it's happening somewhere else. So we do, um, you know, try to speak and have knowledge of that and use each other's audit reports. But I do agree with Joe of trying to find a way and going through the bureaucracy and the standards of it, but <laughs> finding a way that we can collaborate in some ways that makes it as effective and, um, and easily auditable that way. So yeah, that's great. That's a great idea, Supervisor Gilman. Um, Commissioner Matsumura, and then come back to second round for Commissioner Siegel. Commissioner Matsumura. Thank you. Um, I was wondering how you would sort of describe what audits are best suited to do versus what they're not best suited to do. Because there's, you know, there's so many expectations placed on local government to sort of end crime, end homelessness, you know, solve all of the problems. And there's a very particular power that auditors and audits have in looking at the effectiveness of local government. 
but it's also sort of not a cure-all. And so I was wondering if you could just sort of give us what your precise vision of like, here is what you want to call in auditors to do where the real power of that tool lies versus, you know, if you're trying to use an audit to accomplish this, you're gonna be disappointed in the effort. And let me also echo again, the thanks for joining us in the evening and especially Ms. Rose, it sounds like, hopefully this is an improvement on the, the day that you've been having overall. <laughs> A nice getaway actually it's a little crazy day but yeah thank you so that is, that's a it's an interesting question and it's it's a hard question to answer because it's uh i mean i think i mean i'll give you some examples is you know i i mentioned what on our audit right now is something around we've been asked to review how how the, the police department Um, let me get the language. Um, administers the municipal code regulations around firearms. So that is an auditable subject because it's a program in place that we can look to see if it's meeting its, its goals. If the request was something broader, like, can you go audit firearm violence in the city? That's not something that an audit is going to fix. We can look at, we can look at kind of systems. We can look at programs. But if it's if it's uh, a, a, a broad problem uh, that um, homelessness, we can do we've we've done homeless related audits related to homelessness. We've looked at how uh, primarily how the city's working with uh, uh, service providers to provide services under contracts. Uh, and how the city's communicating, going back to Commissioner Gilman's comment about how the committee, how the city's coordinating with the uh, with the county to coordinate care uh, and services. But if the if the audit objective is to is to solve homelessness, it, it, you're going to be disappointed. We can uh, so the more focused the questions. So one of the things I always ask, and this is kind of the way. I think about it is if an audit is proposed, what I ask is what's the what's what's the audit question? What are we being asked to to, to look at? Where's the inefficiency or uh, the, the service delivery uh, pro problem that we're trying to fix? If it's just and I would say just because I mean these big sticky policy questions. Um, are the, those are the hard ones to, to define audit. Now we can take that uh, and then we try to narrow down what it is the question we're gonna ask. That's, I, I mentioned the initiation stage, we send messages to, uh, we have an entrance conference where we talk about where can we add value? Where are the audit questions that we can, we can ask? We send a message to the council members saying, what are the most important things for you? We wanna want be responsive to your concerns. Uh, if we get one of these big, broad questions kind of thrown away, and it's from there, we narrow it down to kind of an auditable subject. Um, but it's those those big kind of uh, go audit that um, kind of questions. Um, you know, I'm trying to think on our work plan right now, we were asked to look at the, uh, the timeliness of the um, SQL process in the city. That is a big project. So we had to take a real hard look at, so what is it that we're gonna be asking? What are we gonna be looking at? What's our criteria? What's it, what it should look like? What does it actually look like in terms from a process standpoint? So when we're talking about processes, we're talking about uh, functions, that's, that those are auditable things. These big amorphous problems are kind of hard to get at. Um, Council, uh, one of the earlier, I think it was Commissioner Fuentes asked about pension sustainability. Um, that was a big sticky question and we really kind of narrowed down. These are the questions we're gonna ask about. We're gonna be really focused in on, one of the problems we saw was that the, the actuarial assumptions built in the model didn't hold true, which blew up in terms of a, a unfunded liability. So we had very specific recommendations about, let's get some actuarial audits in here, make sure this recurring actual audits, make sure these assumptions are right because if you don't get these assumptions right, it's gonna blow up on you. We also talked about, okay, but there's also just functionally, this is an expensive program. What do we do about that? So we said, go talk to the bargaining units because you need to come up with a, a longer term solution from a, from a tier standpoint, which was a lot of people were doing. 
So that's where we took this big sticky policy thing and turn it into an audit by asking some very specific questions about the, uh, the, 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 the plan itself and what's it look like compared to other plans. And also what are these assumptions which blew up on us that caused so much trouble. So that was a long winded answer to your question. I apologize, but it's, it's kind of how we kind of go through our thought process when we get these questions. Okay, I'm gonna move us along. Commissioner Siegel, I'm gonna give you the final word, but I'm gonna ask you to be quick and quick on our response because we have speakers wait, waiting for us that we're expecting to come on at 6.30. So Commissioner Siegel, finish us off. Thank you Thanks. very much again. Um, so the whistleblower, so my subcommittee and a lot of the residents of San Jose would like increased accountability in government. And so, we, we very much appreciate that there is a whistleblower function for um, auditing to the city. This is specifically to Mr. Royce. Um, I understand that the city manager um, assigns audits to you, the city council it, um, approves that. So what do you do when there is a severe conflict of interest and the, um, the, the scandal, the implication involves the city man, manager's office and involves the city council. How are you then going to be able to do your audit when these are the people that permit you to do the audit or recommend the audit? I'm specifically talking about um, the whistleblower who works for the city manager's office, Jill um, Mar Mariani, who, um, who has said that $4.6 million worth of contracts was awarded to Revolutions Food, which is um, which was improper because this was a very close friend and ally of the mayor, Sam Licardo. So how would that ever get audited in the context of the city manager being implicated and the um, city council, or at least the mayor, being implicated? How, how would an accountability even happen? In this well, I want to clarify one thing. You mentioned the administration assigns audits. The administration cannot assign an audit. I am completely independent of the administration. So I do not report to the city manager's office. Uh, I don't, I, I speak with the city manager's office, but I, I'm completely independent from the city manager's office. And in terms of, uh, of I mean, the, what you're describing is, is a procurement uh, question. Uh, and so there are very specific guidelines in the municipal code around procurements. Uh, and there are specific guidelines uh, around how procurements are done. And that is very much within our office's purview to audit the procurement process around any one of those functions. Um, and it's the sort of thing that, again, uh, it would be factored into the risk assessment process if it was something that uh, we felt it was necessary to go to the rules committee and, and have them add it to it, um, then that's what we would do. The, uh, but ultimately it would factor that, you know, it, like I said, it's part of the procurement process. It seems very much uh, procurement is, is, is completely within our purview to audit. Okay, Commissioner Gilman, I see your hand up. Is did you have a final question, or you you just didn't take your hand up? Okay, thank you. And then let me thank uh, Mr. Royce and Ms. Uh, Rose for your coming tonight and for your uh, sharing your expertise and for the service that you provide both to our city and to our county. Uh, we really appreciate your input to the commission, uh, and thank you for your time this evening. I want to move us to our next um, guest, um, which is the police oversight question. Um, and tonight we have Mark Smith, the Inspector General for the Los Angeles Police Commission, Office of the Inspector General. Um, Mr. Smith's been allotted 30 minutes and then questioning it after that. So um, Mr. Smith, welcome and thank you for joining our commission tonight. Uh, appreciate your time and your presence here this evening. Uh, thanks very much for having me. Let me just start off with a quick sound check. Do I get a thumbs up if we're doing okay? Great, excellent. Uh, thank you to uh, uh, the commission for having me and inviting me to speak to you. And a quick thank you also to uh, Commissioner Siegel and a number of the other folks, uh, staff, I assume, who helped uh, get this uh, sort of set up uh, for tonight. I certainly appreciate uh, 
how easy you made it. Um, so uh, my, my goal for tonight is to really try to be of assistance in any way that I can when it comes to this topic of uh, police oversight and accountability. Um, I, I think I can tell from the wide variety of topics that are before this uh, uh, commission, uh, just like those, this one could take up the entire evening and more of a discussion if we if we wanted it to. And so I'll try to uh, sort of tailor my comments, but the, the whole goal is to be of assistance to you and to be a resource. So if there are things you want to direct me towards uh, or uh, questions, of course, that we have time for, uh, those may be uh, sometimes the most valuable focus. Uh, I do have a presentation uh, to do before then, which hopefully will have some uh, helpful information. And before I start that, uh, I think just the first thing I want to do and, and attempt to be helpful is just mention my background. And I promise it's not because I th find it uh, wonderful or interesting to talk about, but more so because I'm hoping it will provide a resource and a place for you to ask questions that will be meaningful to you. And so just very briefly, uh, my whole career has been uh, in the field of civilian oversight of law enforcement. Uh, I have worked, had the opportunity to work in uh, different parts of the country, uh, Southern California and Northern California. The Bay Area is a bit of a second home for me where I went to school. Um, and then also out in the Midwest. Uh, and the, the valuable thing about it, at least I hope will be valuable to you, is I've had the opportunity to see different styles of policing, different styles of oversight of law enforcement agencies, uh, different sizes of oversight agencies, and also agencies in different stages of their growth. One's just being developed, uh, one's kind of uh, uh, that were reformed from a previous iteration into something new, and ones that have been around uh, in a sustained uh, format for a long time. And so uh, for, for, I'm hoping to draw on any and all those experiences, again, with the main goal of just providing you information that, uh, that you'll find helpful in this topic. Um, with that, I'll get started about my current office, the LAPD Office of Inspector General, and I'm going to take a shot at sharing a screen and uh, cross fingers that it works. Excellent. Okay. Um, so uh, th there's more information surely in this uh, PowerPoint than, than maybe we can get through tonight, and I fully recognize that. I'm going to try to focus on just the first few, uh, first small handful of slides and then maybe go a little bit faster through the other stuff and again re uh, um, readjust as you find uh, sort of interesting topics. Uh, I think what may be helpful is sort of the creation and structure of our office, what authorities we have, how we came into being, um, and, and questions that you might be pondering uh, right now uh, in, in your role on this commission. Uh, so for the LAPD's Office of Inspector General, things really got started after the beating of Rodney King by LAPD officers back in 1991. A commission, an independent commission, was formed, uh, later known as the Christopher Commission after Warren Christopher, uh, that looked and said, you know, I think there are some uh, risks in your department based on the behavior of your officers uh, that you need to pay attention to beyond just this particular incident. And one of the recommendations from that Christopher Commission report was the creation of an independent inspector general to assist in uh, accountability for the LAPD. Uh, it wasn't until 1995 that a, uh, a city charter amendment was put into place that really created the Office of Inspector General. Uh, in the ensuing years, the late 90s, LAPD went through what was known as the Rampart Scandal. Uh, I'm guessing it may be familiar to some or all of you, but just to say it briefly, there was a select group of officers within LAPD who were committing uh, quite serious crimes uh, and doing so um, in relation to their status as LAPD officers, things like uh, stealing evidence from uh, LAPD facilities, uh, planting evidence on suspects to justify uses of force, et cetera. Uh, and uh, in 1999, as that sort of was the atmosphere for LAPD, um, a second uh, uh, char uh, a charter amendment, pardon me, uh, really sort of solidified and clarified the authority and independence of the Office of Inspector General, which had already been created. It placed it under the control of LA's Board of Police Commissioners. I'll mention a little bit more about them just momentarily. And it assigned that Board of Police Commissioners the responsibility for really outlining the authorities uh, specifically of the Inspector General's office. So it really kind of solidified the function uh, of the Inspector General's office. Um, and then uh, it was uh, just a couple of years after that, uh, in uh, 2001, I believe, uh, that uh, um, uh, LAPD uh, was uh, um, put under federal oversight uh, under court uh, as part of a consent decree for a persistent uh, violation of civil rights that was very much tied to that Rampart scandal that I mentioned before. 
And that consent decree, uh, it was a designed to last uh, over LAPD, which mandates a certain number of uh, enumerated reforms the department had to uh, meet and then sustain for a period of time. Uh, it was designed to last LAPD for approximately five years. Uh, there are some problems with a few aspects of the implementation, and it ended up lasting 12 years in place for LAPD. Um, and although it didn't necessarily uh, govern or affect um, the Inspector General's office, uh, it really defined a lot of the things that the OIG was, uh, was going to look at over that time period. So as the department was attempting to gain compliance with this uh, federal um, oversight, uh, the OIG was there to sort of watch that process, make sure they were being effective in doing so, help course correct where they were not uh, doing so. Uh, and so it really defined a lot of the focus for the OIG uh, for a sustained period of time for over a decade. Once the um, consent decree ended in 2013, uh, the, it was stated that the OIG would step into the shoes of the federal monitor overseeing the department. Although the department was no longer under federal oversight, it's not a judge enforcing orders anymore, the goal was to prevent any backsliding after the consent decree went away. And so our office has taken up that role for a number of years now uh, to try to be um, uh, a backstop, uh, preventing any um, sort of regression from a lot of the reforms that were put in place under the consent decree. So uh, what we do is provide civilian oversight for LAPD um, and make sure that its officers uh, uh, act professionally and, and police constitutionally. Uh, I'll also talk at, toward the end about community outreach, which is a function of ours as well. Let's see if I can get the next slide. Uh, so our authority, um, we do have what I consider very substantial uh, authority to oversee the department. Um, we report to our police commission, as I mentioned, uh, and that puts us outside the department's chain of command. So none of our staff report to the chief of police and none of the chief of police's staff report to us. Um, both uh, the, the police commission has three direct reports, three employees report to them. One is their executive director, one is the chief of police, and one is the inspector general. And so none of those three report to each other. It gives us our uh, independence from the department while we watch over them. Uh, we have broad investigative authority, um, and I, an investigation is taken uh, as a term that's taken broadly in terms of an actual uh, investigation into a particular officer for misconduct, or more of a systemic investigation to um, an area of concern within the department. Um, one area that I'll get into later on is uh, stops of individuals conducted by the department in different areas and how those stops are conducted. Are they constitutional? Are they have disparate impacts on the community, et cetera? Our access, we've got access to all the LPD's facilities, its records, its documents, its video evidence. Um, and we can compel an employee at penalty of discipline up to including discharge uh, to cooperate uh, with any of our investigations. Uh, there's quite frequently um, the question about subpoena power. I'm sure that is not unfamiliar to you as it's not unfamiliar to just about any uh, commission in your uh, position uh, who is trying to uh, ponder these issues. We do indeed have subpoena power um, but as I can get into more, if you'd like to ask about it, um, as, if it's of interest, uh, it's something that, to my knowledge, was never has never been used uh, by our office. Uh, the reason for that is is kind of a uh, multifaceted. Uh, I mentioned how we got to where we are. It included things like that consent decree, um, which really um, gave force to the need and the role for the OIG. Uh, and in addition to actual subpoena power, which is written into the rules set by our police commission, which they're authorized to do by the city charter, they also state elsewhere that it's uh, just a requirement that all LAPD uh, uh, employees uh, cooperate with the Office of Inspector General, period, that's simple, um, and that all records are accessible to us, period, with, with or without a subpoena. And so subpoena power, while it uh, unquestionably is important, and it's, again, a, an area of focus for any group that is uh, seeking to perform effective oversight of a law enforcement agency. Um, it, it can also come through other forms uh, and other formats that still make it effective. Uh, and there are other times when uh, I can point to my uh, neighbors at LA County, um, it's very well publicized if anyone uh, uh, cares to look, uh, where there is subpoena power, it was a voter passed um, uh, uh, initiative just recently. Uh, there is subpoena power of the sheriff's department, but uh, that doesn't mean that they're getting what they subpoena. Um, there's fight back from the sheriff's department, and this happened even just, I believe, uh, last week, if I'm not mistaken. 
um, where there's a, a, a battle over subpoena. And so it doesn't necessarily mean that once you have it, uh, everything is sort of rosy. Uh, so again, the, what's important to me is access. I'm very, very fortunate, and I try not to take it for granted. Very fortunate. Our office has access, period, full stop, um, and, and we use it. Um, whether that comes through subpoena or other methods is, I think, of slightly less importance. So I don't want to downplay you know, the word subpoena. I know it's a really important term for folks, but access is the key, and we fortunately have it, both through our history. Um, it was hard fought in the early days, way, well before I got here. There are people doing much harder work than I am to try to get that access, uh, but we have it now, uh, and it's uh, something that we rely on very heavily. Um, I can talk more about our access as well. We have access into department systems, including the personnel system directly. We can pull up any officer's uh, personnel history, uh, access to the complaint system. We can uh, uh, open up any pending investigation into misconduct, uh, look at the evidence, uh, listen to the uh, audio recorded interviews, uh, uh, medical uh, records, uh, ballistic evidence, whatever it might be. Um, we have access into the cloud-based system for body-worn video, uh, so we can directly access any officer's body-worn video. Our access is, is, is complete, and it makes a huge, huge difference for us in, in how we operate. Uh, so here's, here's our, uh, just a little org chart. I, I referenced it before. The reason that it's important, uh, I'll tell you, is, um, uh, is again, it, it gives us our independence. And the other reason it's important is because that Board of Police Commissioners there are five appointees of the mayor of Los Angeles. They are volunteers. They serve um, five-year terms. And the importance is that they are there above the chief in the org chart. For LA, uh, unlike some places, not that this is the only way or the best way, but it's just our way. For LA, the LAPD is headed by a civilian board, not the chief of police. It's often kind of compared roughly to uh, a board of directors of a company. That would be the board of police commissioners. And the CEO or the COO would be the chief of police who runs everything day to day. Uh, but uh, if there is any substantial policy, such as one involving the use of force or a change to the department's use of force policy, or even things that are a little less substantial but have any kind of public influence, the chief cannot unilaterally implement that policy. It must come to the Board of Police Commissioners for their adoption in a public meeting before it becomes uh, official. And any policy that is adopted by the Board of Police Commissioners is then enforceable um, on the department. The chief's job is to implement it at penalty of potentially being removed as a chief of police, um, if not that that has uh, ever come close. Uh, but uh, all that is a long-winded way to say they're the top of the org chart. The chief is below them. Uh, he's a direct report just as I am. Uh, and so for us, it's a civilian head of the agency um, that, uh, uh, that really gives us our authority. One other thing to mention just about this chart is uh, our, our office, the OIG, is often described as the eyes and ears of the commission. So as they are a volunteer agency, they put in, uh, as I'm sure is not unfamiliar to this group of commissioners, they put in a lot of hours every week as volunteers. Um, and again, I, I can only imagine that's, that's uh, not unfamiliar. Uh, but um, they don't necessarily have, uh, this isn't their full-time job. And so that's what our office is there to do, is to make sure that we um, carry out their directives, their wishes, and can be the investigative arm uh, for that police commission as they act as the head of the department. Uh, so getting a little more specific into the Office of Inspector General, uh, we really have five primary sections. I know there are four here. Um, uh, there are uh, these four plus um, uh, one is our admin section that really supports uh, the entire office. Uh, but these are our four main sections. Um, our use of force section, complaints, audits and reviews, and then as I mentioned before, community involvement, community engagement. Um, I'll kind of go through these sections a little bit uh, briefly. Um, I think then I'll hopefully wrap up and, and try to, again, answer questions in hopes that that's uh, the most helpful part of the process for you. So uh, our oversight responsibility comes in a number of different forms. Um, within our complaint uh, section, we are an intake point for complaints of misconduct against LAPD uh, officers or any LAPD employee, civilian and sworn. Uh, we are not the only place that someone can go to file a complaint, but it's important to me that any member of the public in particular who uh, feels they've been mistreated by the police, uh, whether something uh, relatively minor or something severe like excessive force, that they understand they don't have to go back to that same police department to make their complaint. 
And so we take complaints in any form. Um, someone can walk into our office, at least they could pre-COVID. We're, we're not quite back to in-office uh, visits just yet, but I'm sure we will be. They can call us, fax us, um, submit something online, um, send us an email or mail us a letter. Um, what's important to me about the complaint aspect uh, for LAPD, and this goes for our office as well as the department, the rules are the same, uh, that we have what I call a low barrier to entry for complaints. Uh, you can file your complaint anonymously. You can file a complaint about something that happened 15 years ago. Um, and we certainly do not uh, question or care about uh, citizenship or immigration status or, or anything like that. Um, if you have a concern about the LAPD, we want to make sure that uh, our office is accessible uh, to listen to that concern. We do also take complaints from LAPD employees against other LAPD employees. And that's not uh, as frequent as from the public, but it's not infrequent either. Um, it could be things like workplace issues, it could be harassment, um, uh, it could be other, uh, other forms of misconduct as well, anytime one employee feels that misconduct has happened. We are also a, uh, a center to um, uh, file commendations uh, for LAPD employees. We accept those as well. Uh, we would pass those on to the department uh, for, uh, for appropriate response. Uh, with regard to complaints, Although we have the authority to conduct investigations, we are primarily a monitoring agency. Uh, so we watch over uh, internal affairs and the department's own discipline system. We do so quite closely and intently. Um, we have the authority to, to conduct investigation that has happened on, uh, on some occasions. And there's a small subset of investigations that we conduct specifically if any allegation of misconduct is raised against the chief of police, that one employee within the uh, uh, sort of 12 to 13,000 member uh, uh, department of LAPD, uh, we will conduct that investigation so it's removed from the chief chain of command to avoid any conflict of interest um, or undue influence. Uh, so we will uh, collect the evidence there, talk to witnesses, talk to the chief as the accused officer, um, gather any other evidence. And then we present our findings, our recommended findings to the police commission, who's the chief's boss, who make an ultimate determination on whether or not any misconduct occurred. Um, but that's a very, very tiny subset of the complaints that happen for LAPD each year. Most of the time, when a complaint comes to us, we have a duty to transmit it to internal affairs. And then we will watch to ensure that the internal affairs process and investigation into that complaint is done in an unbiased and impartial fashion. Uh, we act as a bit of a quality control to make sure that IA is doing their job uh, the way that they should. Uh, again, we have access to look at any complaint, whether it came to our office or not. And sometimes we'll uh, learn of a high profile complaint that we want to follow or a trend in complaints. Uh, maybe there's been, um, I'm only making this up hypothetically, a rise in domestic violence complaints against officers, a rise in alcohol related complaints against officers. Um, we will then, uh, with our discretion, say, you know, we're going to pull some of those cases and look at them and see what's happening, uh, how are the investigations going, and, and what can we determine. Um, but uh, if one complaint comes to us, uh, and it's of something uh, of a serious nature, we have the authority to sort of monitor that complaint through to its completion, and we'll just kind of watch it uh, to make sure it's uh, handled appropriately. Um, let's see, we can also look for trends. Uh, and areas of deficiency uh, that we can then make recommendations for change to the department's policy. And sometimes we're in a unique position to see that by having access to all the complaints. Um, so Internal Affairs and, and LAPD's Professional Standards Bureau uh, is one place to see that. Uh, but as an independent entity, um, we can see that more than an individual command, uh, such as one division from LAPD, which uh, you know, may have uh, complaint investigations done for their division. They may not know what's going on in the other 20 divisions across the city of Los Angeles. We have the ability to watch that. Uh, the next section I want to mention is our audits and reviews section. Um, we, uh, as part of the, that broad term of investigations, uh, and historically, under the consent decree and, and even outside the consent decree that I mentioned, uh, part of our office's function is to look at the department systemically. Um, a lot of the uh, past work in this, uh, uh, in this area was guided by that consent decree, things that needed periodic reviews, quarterly checks, semi-annual checks, or annual checks. Um, and now, outside the consent decree, we really have the freedom to look at anything that we want to. Um, and we had that before, but not necessarily the capacity to do everything at once. Uh, now we have the freedom to look at any areas that we want. 
Um, we are most often guided by our police commission, my bosses, who might say, hey, we have a concern about this, or we're hearing from the community a concern about that. Can you look into it? Can you do a project on that? And we'll, we'll, of course, say yes. Uh, the only way that um, one of our projects, if we decide to do uh, a, an audit or a, another report on some area of the department, the only way we could be stopped from doing so is by a majority vote of the police commission in public session to say that they don't want to see that. Uh, to my knowledge, that never happened in the existence of uh, the OIG in the last uh, uh, 26 years or so. Um, and so, uh, we again, we take guidance from some uh, uh, things that the office has looked at in the past, and maybe it's been four or five years since we looked at a particular topic of concern, and we say, boy, it's about time. We want to look at that again and see what progress has been made, um, what gains and, and reforms have been sustained, and, and where is the department falling short. Um, or, again, if the commission asks us to look at any particular area, we will do so. Uh, these are just some of the uh, highlights of what we looked at recently, and I'll mention just the, the last one on that little bullet pointed list, uh, national best practices. One of the functions we did was to take President Obama's task force on 21st century policing. Uh, we uh, selected a few of the most important core principles that were relevant to LAPD and did a bit of a report card to say, well, how's LAPD doing and how do they measure up and where are they falling short? What can they do better? Uh, our reports uh, went with very, very few exceptions, none that I can think of right now, unless we had to, are all public. They are presented publicly to the commission when they're completed, and we post them online on our website uh, and keep them up there for anyone to look at with our recommendations. Um, once we do make a recommendations to the police commission, if those recommendations are adopted, and usually they are, uh, they, again, are then binding on the department. So if we have said, boy, we recommend the department do better at X or better at Y or revise its policy on Z, and the commission adopts that recommendation, it is then the chief's job uh, to uh, implement it because it's binding on the department. Uh, There's just a few of the areas that, that we have impacted uh, in, in recent times. Um, one example of uh, our, one of our biggest projects last year, uh, I think I mentioned earlier in my uh, discussion, was looking at stops, law enforcement stops of individuals across the city. And these were some of the uh, sort of findings that we had and uh, recommendations that we made to the department that were adopted uh, by the commission. And they needed to clarify uh, their parameters regarding what's a consensual encounter and what's not. Uh, we think that there are many stops that were um, um, passed off as consensual encounters, but in reality, the people being stopped did not uh, feel free to leave. Um, they need to adequate, uh, adequately uh, articulate the legal basis for their searches. Um, we wanted to uh, make sure they obtain affirmative consent for consensual searches to clarify that issue that I mentioned before. Uh, and then we watched, uh, you know, we saw some deficiencies with their activation of body-worn video and digital in-car video cameras. That's what the DICV stands for. And so we want to uh, uh, make sure they focused on that as well. All of these things they are working on presently as these uh, were recommendations that were ultimately adopted by our commission. And then also we have a, a major focus on procedural justice and de-escalation during stops. And part of what our office does um, is to work with the department sort of side by side on some of their policy language. So if we've made a recommendation to the commission to focus more on procedural justice, to enhance our de-escalation uh, uh, tactics and training, uh, and the department says, okay, we're gonna cre create a new policy or new training program to do that, they will generally pass it by us first and get comments and feedback and we will assist them in implementing that. They do not have to, but if they don't, and they uh, implement something poorly or, or use the wrong language that doesn't succeed, uh, they're, they're gonna suffer for it. And so they, I think, recognize that, hey, if the OIG has made a recommendation before we put our solution in place, let's talk to them about it. Let's have them revise it. Let's have them help us make sure it satisfies what they want before we go back to our bosses of the commission and say, here's what our uh, implementation is. And so a lot of our work comes through that type of communication with them, uh, redlining of, of documents and policies and discussions of uh, new training programs and what should be enhanced and whether or not it meets uh, the goals that we had set out. Uh, our next section is our use of force section. I think this one may be of less interest. So 
if I haven't done so already, I'll try to speed up on this one. Um, and if I'm if I'm running short on time, let me know. But hopefully we're okay. Uh, our use of force section. Uh, we are uh, uh, authorized and uh, respond to all what's called categorical uses of force. Those are the major uses of force by LAPD each year. Um, this year we're a little bit higher than in past years. So these number right now we're at uh, I think 59 uh, so far through calendar year 2021. Um, that's a little bit more than the last couple of years, but uh, six, seven, eight years ago it used to be much higher well above 100. Uh, and so there's a giant dip that happened uh, a number of years ago, and we're just on a little bit of an upward trend now. Uh, so those major uses of force, our office is required to be notified immediately. And then we will respond to the scene of the incident. We have an on-call uh, rotation uh, of staff uh, who are ready 24 hours a day uh, to respond to the scene of this incident. And then that staff member from our office will stand um, side by side, shoulder to shoulder, did the officers involved in these incidents, uh, officer involved shootings is the easiest example, did those officers conform to their training uh, and to all department policies when they used that uh, lethal force? Um, so they will be there gathering the evidence. We stand next to them. The first time that they will watch the officer's body-worn video, we'll watch it with them. Uh, usually they're at the scene, actually. Uh, and then uh, our, our use of force section will uh, follow that investigation through to its completion. Usually that's around an eight or nine month process as these, uh, as you may be familiar, are very detailed investigations with uh, ballistic evidence, forensic evidence, toxicology evidence, uh, and, and many other things, as well as uh, interviews of uh, um, the involved parties, all the involved officers, uh, witnesses, canvassing for witnesses, et cetera. Once that uh, process is complete, so the department has completed its investigation, they will submit it up their chain of command. We have access again to all that evidence. We're watching side by side. And they will actually ask us for guidance. Hey, do you think we need to ask any more questions about this? Do you have anything that we have, uh, any questions that we, the detectives, haven't gathered that you'd like us to? And we will advise them if we do. They will then submit that completed package up the chain of command to the chief of police, who will sign off on some recommendations uh, of findings as to whether or not the officers acted within policy or outside of policy. Uh, our office separately will create our own set of recommendations um, that may or may not match the chief's recommendations. Oftentimes they do, sometimes they do not. Both sets of recommendations, ours and signed by me and the chief's signed by him, will then go to our police commission, uh, which meets in, for this matter in a closed session and the commission adjudicates whether or not all the involved officers conformed to their training and policy. If they did not, the commission then goes back to the chief and says this officer violated policy and it's the chief's discretion of what remedial action to take, whether it be retraining or discipline up to including um, termination from the department. Um, Let's see, uh, uh, within our use of force section, in addition to those specific incidents, that's our primary focus for sure, but we also do some projects uh, looking at patterns and systemic issues, um, try to address those. Uh, we help, again, reform the department's use of force policy or any time that the department is reforming use of force policy, possibly because of its own uh, desire to get better uh, and, and make some corrections, possibly due to recently passed state um, legislation uh, they will always pass that to us first before finalizing it. So we have a say in the matter, even if uh, we um, cannot force them to change anything, they want to get our buy-in and input before it goes to the commission, who's the big boss of the department. Uh, the last section I want to get to um, was our community relations. Uh, just briefly that we do have a function, although we're a smallish office, uh, again, we want to make sure the community knows we are a resource for them. Uh, that, that's why our office was created, so that the community has a voice uh, and has some dedicated professionals uh, who are there to oversee their police department and make sure their uh, uh, police department is acting the way that the community wants it to act. Um, so we respond to a wide variety of public messages. We are on social media uh, when there are uh, large-scale police activities, some of the protest activities that we all saw um, uh, summer of last year as well as other uh, activities, celebrations for uh, sporting events, for instance, uh, when sometimes those crowd control uh, incidents result in uses of force by LAPD, uh, we uh, are, are very actively um, sought out on social media to uh, raise complaints in certain instances. So we try to be very responsive to that. We have a Twitter page and uh, a Twitter account and Facebook page. 
Um, and we also try to go out into the community again, pre-COVID, try to meet with all the stakeholders uh, in, the, uh, in the city of Los Angeles, uh, the clergy, the LGBTQ community, the dis uh, disabled community, um, and basically anyone, uh, a lot of youth groups, anyone who we think might have an interest in uh, learning about the resources available to them if they feel that their policing has not acted in the way that they wanted to act. Um, I'll, I'll skip this. I, I worry I'm running long on time. I want to get, I really, I think the question is maybe most valuable. Uh, this is just some of the results that we had. Um, it's uh, probably through our office's input um, and advice that uh, the department has a new uh, de-escalation policy, uh, that the department went through its process to start automatically releasing video of those critical incidents that I mentioned, like officer-involved shootings. They release the body-worn video typically within 45 days, if not sooner. It was our office that helped craft that policy. Um, and, uh, we have a mobile app, which was a, a, an important thing for us that we created to, again, try to be accessible. Just some of the things that, that we uh, try to do as oversight professionals. And here's some contact information if I can be helpful. I, I apologize for rushing at the end, but I'm just I'm anxious to get to questions in, in hopes that that'll be the most helpful for folks. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Thank you so much, Mr. Smith. Really appreciate it. And your thoroughness was excellent. Um, I know that commissioners can get copies of your slides if there's really specifics. Uh, commissioners, questions? I will provide the, that uh, those slides. I, I apologize for not doing so, but I sure will. Thank you. Appreciate it. Commissioner Siegel. Commissioner Siegel, you're muted. Thank you so much for being here, taking time away from your family to help educate us. It, it's really amazing, Mr. Smith, that you're doing this for a city that's a little bit far away from you. So we really, really appreciate it. I also know that you used to um, be the um, oversight person at BART and we did have BART speak to us as well. Um, so thank you. I have a couple of questions. The first is, so you have a board of police commissioners and they're civilians and they're voluntary um, and they are the head of both the police department and also of you, of all the oversight. How are they chosen? So they are selected by the mayor, mayoral appointees. Um, and uh, the, I think the design is to try to have them be representative uh, of various different communities in Los Angeles, but uh, they do not have sort of geographic uh, boundaries uh, to them. Um, they are not sworn law enforcement officers. Uh, they can be uh, former uh, law enforcement officers. Uh, but, uh, uh, but at the end of the day, to answer your question, they are uh, mayoral appointees. Okay, thank you. Um, and then also, when we were speaking before, you mentioned that there, um, there's a program that you're working on when officers stop and there's a perception among um, civilians that they're being laughed at every time they're stopped. Can you tell us how that the oversight is working with that? Yeah, and this was something that I think we mentioned uh, when I had a chance to speak with on the phone. Um, it's a little bit, little bit different than, than, um, than you described it. Uh, there have been a couple of studies out uh, of departments um, uh, on how officers um, interact verbally and vocalize uh, with uh, people during um, uh, stops, law enforcement stops, like traffic stops or pedestrian stops or what have you. Um, one very uh, famous study was uh, right there in Oakland. Um, it was done by a group called SPARK, S-P-A-R-Q, um, led by Dr. Jennifer Eberhardt at Stanford, um, that looked at really the, the uh, tone of voice even of officers. Did they even remove the words that were stated? Uh, but just that how does officers' tone of voice change uh, when they're stopping different people? And uh, do, does ethnicity of the person being stopped, does ethnicity of the officer? Uh, have uh, uh, you know any impact on how the that vocalization changes? Um, the, it was a really interesting study. There was another one done uh, by a group uh, uh, that I think was based out of the University of Michigan, if I'm not mistaken, um, at a mid-sized police department. Um, uh, I don't recall where, maybe in the Midwest. Uh, and so our commission recently, uh, the LA uh, Los Angeles Police Commission, recently asked our office if we could do something uh, approximating that. And although our our work will be a little bit different. Uh, what we have just begun, just embarked on, uh, is a project um, within our audit section that will look at um, terminology and, and words used by LAPD officers during stops. Um, just to give you a for instance, uh, do, is it in one part of the city, 
is it more common uh, for officers to um, refer to someone as bro or um, yo man or use informal speech um, versus other parts of the city where it's ma'am and sir? Uh, and if so, why is that? Um, uh, and there, uh, is it uh, common for some parts of the city for officers to ask, um, are you on parole or probation even before they begin conversing otherwise with the person who was stopped and tell them why they were stopped? Uh, and is that different in other parts of the city? Um, so that was a request from the police commission. We have just started that project, so it'll be months in the works. Uh, and one of the things that you reminded me of, Commissioner Siegel, was um, uh, I was listening to the, the previous uh, speakers a little bit um, uh, with regard to audits. Uh, the background of our staff really varies. Some of them are trained auditors, and, uh, uh, and they actually have a classification called police performance auditor, and they have the capability and skills to conduct uh, um, uh, true audits uh, uh, through the, so the, the yellow book or GAGIS standards or uh, government accounting standards, and some of our audits really are indeed compliance audits that focus that way. Some of our audits, even we use that term a little broadly is the point I'm trying to get to, are reports like the one that I mentioned to you just a moment ago, where it's really more of, of a project or a report and not a true pure audit, uh, but we have uh, skill, staffs, uh, uh, skill sets pardon me, on staff for that as well. Everything from folks who are attorneys uh, to folks who are certified fraud examiners to folks who are former law enforcement officers, both from departments here in California, as well as across the country, as well as some law enforcement officers formerly uh, abroad. And they bring us a very wide perspective in trying to look at areas like this and, and uh, give us a lot of things to think about as we, as we look at LAPD specifically. Thank you, Commissioner Zhao, and then Commissioner Percival, and then Commissioner Monley. Commissioner Zhao. Hi, Mark. Um, my uh, question is that uh, whether your office have your own attorney or you are using the city attorney instead? Uh, we do uh, rely on the city attorney. There is a group of city attorneys who are um, sort of specially dedicated to our police commission, and that includes our office as we work for the police commission. Uh, and um, I think there are, you know, as I looked at different systems across the country and places that I've worked, it's certainly not uncommon to have questions about, you know, uh, is that the right way to do it and to wall off a part of the uh, city attorney's office to uh, avoid conflicts of interest as they also represent the city in litigation, as they represent the department uh, as well. Um, and and I, I don't think there's any one single answer. I think our system works well for us, but it's not because it's the only way to do it. Um, it wouldn't be a mistake, I wouldn't say, for us to have a separate counsel, but uh, there is a walled off portion of the city attorney's office that is assigned just to the commission to deal with any issues that come to us, whether they be litigation, which happens uh, sometimes, whether they be um, uh, CPRA requests, which come to our office as they do to the department itself and to the commission itself, um, whether they be even employment issues. Uh, we have resources uh, just for our office at the city attorney's office where they're assigned to us. And so that system works well. Again, I don't think it's the only way to do it, but that's the way we do it. Thank you, Commissioner Zell. Commissioner Percival. Uh, thanks, Mr. Smith, for your um, for your uh, your time tonight. It's been really, really insightful. Um, I, have, I have a couple, couple of questions. Um, one, I'll, I'll start, though, with um, if you could explain a little bit more about the relationship between the mayor of Los Angeles in the in the police commission. Um, if I remember correctly, um, you mentioned the Rodney King um, beating of Rodney King in the early 90s. Uh, one of the problems that was very apparent was the mayor, I think it was Tom Bradley at the time, could not fire the police chief, um, even though the police chief was um, under a lot of scrutiny for, for that. Um, it's my understanding now that the mayor can fire the police chief. Um, and if you could speak to a little bit about how that uh, that structure's changed in Los Angeles, the reasons behind it, um, and the relationship between the mayor and the commission, you said the mayor can can appoint members of the commission. So if you could just sort of clarify the relationship between the mayor, commission, and the and the police chief. Yes, uh, sure, I'll, I'll do my best. Uh, so uh, as I mentioned before, the, the commissioners are appointees uh, of the mayor. They serve really at the pleasure of the mayor. The mayor can uh, you know, work with commissioners to uh, remove them or change them as, as, uh, as he or she uh, so desires. Um, uh, the, uh, the chief of police, uh, again, really reports directly to just the commission. Um, the chief of police certainly 
has a very active working relationship with the mayor, uh, but it's really the commission's job to conduct performance evaluations for the chief of police. Uh, the commission is authorized by city charter to, and I'm actually, I'm, I'm cheating and reading off my notes here from our city charter, which is obviously available, uh, evaluate the chief of police annually, set or adjust the compensation for the chief of police within the salary guidelines established by city council, um, uh, and to, to uh, uh, sort of conduct other sort of personnel business uh, as it affects the chief of police. So, so again, the chief is really a direct report employee to the police commission. Now, with that said, there are some uh, a couple of processes for removal of the chief of police, and it can be initiated in, in a couple of different ways. Um, uh, and this is, I, I would actually, I want to be really candid with you. I'd have to go in, back and, and double check to make sure I have all the intricacies right. So please, uh, if, if you don't mind, don't quote me on it, but to say it basically, there is a method for the mayor to move for removal of a chief. However, it would need to go to the city council, to, I believe to the police commission and or the city council first. There is a method for the city council or, or possibly through the president of the city council um, or, or maybe the city council as a whole to also move for removal of the chief of police, but there would be a check with me first uh, at either the mayor or the police commission. Um, so it's a, it's a multifaceted process, uh, but it can come from uh, a couple of those different places. Uh, but the uh, chief still remains beholden to the police commission in many ways, again, because of those performance evaluations, uh, even the setting of salary, which, as, as I'm sure you know, isn't a, a very frequent uh, uh, topic or, or, or frequent, uh, um, frequently changing uh, thing. But, um, but there are evaluations that take place, maybe on specific areas or on general performance, and that's all the purview of the commission on behalf of the mayor who appointed them, uh, even though there are methods of removal for each of those different entities. I know it's a little vague, and, and again, I, I apologize, I don't have all the, the specifics directly in front of me, but um, hopefully it gets to your question, and let, please let me know if not. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, and just one, one other uh, follow-up question. You, you mentioned um, in, in your office, Inspector General's office, you do a lot of work on, on data collection, or at least data analysis, um, I'm curious whether there's um, your office has done um, work on uh, sort of analyzing disparities, racial disparities, and ethnic disparities in, in, in police stops, but also um, in the last year, really since um, I think the tragedy of George Floyd's death, uh, murder um, last 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 year, uh, there's been a lot of attention to the fact that. Um, uh, what, what's in police reports is often not uh, an accurate assessment of what happens at the actual scene. Um, and this is, I think, particularly true as we have more, uh, you know, cell phone camera footage of, of these of these incidents. Um, has there been any, any effort by your office, any discussions about trying to get, you know, a, a sample, uh, maybe a, some sort of random sample of, I know, the tens of thousands of stops in a city the size of L.A.? about uh, some, maybe an audit of, uh, you know, how accurate, uh, based on the best available evidence of, of, of police, initial police reports and uh, later uh, assessments of the accuracy of those. Yeah, um, it's a great question. There's nothing preventing us um, from, from conducting that type of audit and or review. And again, I know I use those terms a little interchangeably. Um, what generally has happened in the past is that Questions like that are folded into the reviews that we do involving uh, uh, various police activities, most notably stops. I'll give you, for instance, so uh, our, our biggest project last year was our stops report. We did a number of other ones, um, and again, they're all available online if, uh, if they ever should be helpful to you. Um, but our biggest project was on stops, and again, as, as you said, it looked at disparities and, um, and who's being stopped where, who's being searched, uh, how many uh, pieces of contraband are being recovered uh, in this type of stop versus that type of stop, how many are consensual stops, how many are um, uh, discretionary stops, et cetera. Um, as part of that, uh, and the reason, part of the reason that our projects often take a, a substantial amount of time, uh, we look holistically at all of the um, records uh, involving uh, that topic. So in other words, when we did a sample of stops for our, our audit uh, across the city, we looked at, at that stop at every police report uh, that was made about the stop, arrest reports, incident reports, use of force reports, and otherwise. Uh, we looked at all body-worn video that was recorded um, uh, in conjunction with that stop. 
Uh, we looked at um, what's called uh, for LAPD uh, field data reports or kind of officer logs, uh, even apart from specific reports on that stop, um, as well as other documents and records. And so we look at everything. And if we did indeed find that there was misstatement or um, sort of misinterpretation or, or any other word you want to put to it as far as uh, how these uh, stops are being reported in any fashion, whether it be about uh, the reason for the stop, something significant like that, or even something minor, uh, such as the number of people in the vehicle, if they kind of uh, misrepresented the number of people in the vehicle that was stopped, we will find those errors and it will become a part of um, what we look at a, a, in our report, um, or at least generally we will. That's not to say that we're prevented from doing a report specifically focused and titled just what you've said. And I think that there's, there would be nothing wrong with doing so. Uh, but in, in our stops report, I think that was folded in. And the last example I'll give is in one other report we did a few years back on a stop for a particular penal code section, 148, um, which is uh, often, often seen as a, it's resist, lightly resisting arrest. And uh, the problem with it is it's often um, um, sort of seen as a contempt of cop uh, stop where uh, if there's a use of force related to uh, a resisting arrest stop and the only criminal violation was resisting arrest, you know, how did this get to the point where it's a use of force when there's no other crime that's associated there? Anyway, we looked at those stops. Uh, we also looked at uh, stops specifically by gang enforcement details because there had a number of concerning problems with them. The point I'm getting to is in each of those reports, we also would look at every piece of evidence, every report, and look at the accuracy of those reports. And if we found that there was a problem with the accuracy in the reporting over and over again, that would become part of our report or potentially lead to a brand new one in the next year. Okay, I'm gonna move us quickly on. Commissioner Monley and then Commissioner Fuentes. Commissioner Monley. Yes, thank you so much for coming tonight. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. Um, I'm curious to know um, how high a profile the police commission takes uh, in general and when uh, there are issues that the police commission needs to look at that might be uncomfortable. Um, for either the police or the public. And I'm also wondering um, if, if there is an, I don't wanna say improvement, um, but I want to know if there's a reaction that is positive from the public toward the police because of your, uh, your actions. And um, I'll just leave the rest to you to speak to that. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, and both of them difficult questions, but important ones. As far as profile, um, uh, you know, it depends a little bit on, on how you define that profile, uh, what's high profile, what's not. Uh, but uh, the commission, you know, does meet weekly in, in public, um, just uh, and right now on Zoom, just like this. Uh, and of course, they're a Brown Act body, so they take public comment and, uh, and react to that public comment. It doesn't have to be during the meeting. You can submit public comment otherwise as well. Uh, but so, so we meet weekly uh, out in public. Um, and, uh, and it's quite common for them to address with the chief, address with members of the public, address with my office if necessary, um, the issues of the day, whether it be, again, sort of the protests after George Floyd, um, COVID uh, vaccination issues, um, you know, whatever issues might arise, uh, the, the commission doesn't shy away from you. And as the head of the department, um, I think in that sense, you know, they are kind of a, um, not high profile is not the word I want, but uh, they don't shy away from sort of uh, addressing and tackling publicly the major issues of the department. Uh, the commission does have its own staff as well, separate from my office. It's a group of employees who are there to support the commission, like a, a secretary um, and a, a number of other folks. Uh, the commission has functions like uh, dealing with uh, um, uh, businesses who are licensed to have an alarm that draw police response, they have to pay fees. They have a, uh, my point is they have a staff to themselves. Part of that staff, is a media relations coordinator. And so there are media inquiries to the commission on, on a somewhat frequent basis. And so the, the commission may make statements to the media when, feel, when they feel appropriate to do so. And sometimes that level of um, expression depends on the who is the president of the commission. That kind of rotates roughly each one to two years. Uh, and so some presidents may be more um, uh, open to that and, and others may be more closed off to it. Uh, and, and I apologize, I know the second part of your question, I'm sorry. Uh, I was wondering if um, if there is um, a um, an increase in appreciation for police behavior and tactics. Uh, is there a is there a suggestion that the public and the and um, 
police behaviors are coming together in a very positive way. And before you answer that, Mr. Smith, I'm gonna ask all commissioners to mute yourselves. We're getting feedback. There's a number of commissioners that are not muted. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Thank you for that. Um, I, I think maybe I was trying to duck the really hard question by forgetting it. Yes, that's a really tough question. Um, uh, it, you know, I think perspectives run the gamut uh, of whether or not um, you know there should there is should be a positive uh, response to you know uh, some of the reforms that we put in place. It, it can be a hard sell. Uh, we're often I often describe us as someone who's not liked by anybody. Uh, the public doesn't think that we do enough to hold the police accountable. Um, that not enough discipline. Um, is uh, enforced upon officers who commit wrongdoing, um, that there are too many of the proverbial bad apples still spoiling the bunch. And the police department often, and, and sometimes police unions, and I'll speak not just about LA, but other places too, often think that we do too much. We are uh, too often crossing their T's and dotting their I's and doing so from a civilian perspective who doesn't understand uh, the, the rigors of the job. And uh, so we, we get kind of caught in the middle and oftentimes that old maxim is true that if the public doesn't think we're doing enough and the police think we're doing way too much, uh, maybe that's a bit of a sweet spot where we should be. But um, that's a, it's a convenient answer, but I think there are times when maybe there's realization uh, that having this accountability mechanism and a backstop against LAPD going back to the days of Rampart, back to the days of Rodney King. Um, having that backstop is crucial. I think some folks realize that, but in today's climate, it's a hard sell to hear those voices as opposed to uh, some of the other voices on either side of the policing issue. Commissioner Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith, for joining us tonight, joining with us tonight at our meeting. Um, my question is related to, um, does your off does your office have any influence or um, make recommendations when it's clear that the person, the say the officer who who made an error and you know really mistreated people, that there is some type of a psychological issue going on and that psychological evaluations, testing is required. Um, in those instances, and um, and I'm sure there there are some that have occurred. I mean, we've witnessed some of them on the media, unfortunately. Um, can you let us know um, in what way your office addresses that that area? Please. Sure. Uh, formally, no, um, and and it would be a little outside of both of our our purview and certainly our areas of expertise um, to. Uh, um, make assessments like that uh, and source formalized recommendations in, in a more um, excuse me I'm sorry I, I didn't uh, forgive me I didn't mean that you would make the assessments but would make the recommendations to the department to address that yeah even with those recommendations uh, my, my response would would be the same uh, but on a more informal basis um, if if you know we saw a concern um, with regard to an officer, um, uh, you know, uh, maybe there's one involving domestic violence and alcohol abuse, and there are statements made by the officer that indicate um, that uh, he or she may pose a danger to himself or others. We know that the department has processes in place uh, to potentially remove uh, weapons uh, from that officer's uh, sphere, uh, but in our role, we'd be monitoring the personnel investigation into the allegations of domestic violence, the allegations of you know, inappropriate behavior with alcohol. And we might inquire uh, to the department, ha have you taken those steps? Have you considered this? Um, if they haven't, our recourse is uh, merely to sort of raise it up the chain of command. Uh, I might have a conversation with uh, you know, the head of Professional Standards Bureau, if, and if that didn't get any traction, I might have a conversation with the chief of police. And if that didn't get any traction, I would then ultimately have a conversation with the police commission and say, we're reviewing this complaint about domestic violence by Officer X, and in part of the investigation into this um, misconduct, there was a statement made that Officer X sounds like he or she may pose a danger to himself or others, and we think the department needs to consider removing firearms from this individual. The chief has said no, uh, and so uh, commission, I want to alert you to that. Commission then, as the chief boss, has you know sort of uh, authority to at least address it with him, even if they can't enforce it upon him. So informally, uh, that's one way. Um, but generally, th that would be a very unusual uh, set of circumstances. The department generally, as they brief us on what they've done, they have 
uh, already taken those steps. And so they brief us as a confirmation that it's happened. Um, and that's, that's usually how it goes. Um, the other thing that we do is uh, the department has a number of uh, performance uh, evaluation systems, uh, just one of which is called Risk Management um, Executive Committee or REMAC. That's for problematic officers who may need to be assigned um, uh, away from their normal assignments, possibly have no public contact, possibly not be able to carry a weapon and assigned to another function of the department because of past behavior or a pattern of past behavior. And then they're put on an evaluation plan to see if they can be uh, sort of uh, rehabilitated and put back into normal uh, uh, role, et cetera. Um, and our office sits in on those meetings and can provide advice and counsel. We do not have a vote on whether or not the officer should be uh, sent to psychological testing uh, or, or sent more frequently to psychological testing. We don't have a vote whether the officer gets reassigned, but we have a voice in the room. So to answer your question, uh, no, that's that's pretty unusual, but informally, we watch for that. We can we are briefed on when that happens, and if it doesn't happen when we think it should, we can raise a voice to say we have a concern. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Smith, and I really appreciate your time and your thoroughness, as well as your answers to our questions tonight. On behalf of the commission, thank you for joining us this evening. Um, commissioners, I'm going to move us on to our next item um, and uh, introduce on the policing oversight um, uh, uh, issue. The next speaker is Mika Isramera, the deputy public defender in the Santa Clara County Office of the Public Defender, and is also president of the La Raza Lawyers Local Chapter. And um, welcome to you, Mr. Isramera. And there you are, Mika. Um, welcome, and you have uh, your time to be able to, to speak. Go ahead. Thanks, everyone, and good evening. Thanks for welcoming me here to talk a little bit about policing uh, and the history of policing. Um, I, I want to start with a couple things before I begin. One is I'm on the back end of a uh, bout of food poisoning, so if I'm not 100%, I say something wacky. Um, just let that slide this time, please. Um, and the second is I'm actually providing a presentation that was done by Professor Bill Armeline, who's a PhD and uh, director of the Human Rights Institute at San Jose State University. So I am, um, I am following an outline in notes uh, developed by someone else, uh, but I've obviously consulted with him and I'm happy to make them and any other support material available to you. Um, so, uh, so I just kind of want to put that out there in, in, before I begin. And the last thing is, um, I will address the Jones Jimenez memo at the end of my presentation with a brief commentary. So I'm going to share my screen here and get started. And I assume everybody can see that if not. Okay, great. Um, so we will begin today by covering um, some really basic kind of contextual contextualization of BLM uh, policing, the history of policing, recent events, um, and then uh, really a lot of data uh, to kind of uh, underscore some of the uh, some of the problems that we're seeing and some objective measurements that warrant the kind of oversight. Uh, accountability and transparency that, that we were just talking about uh, in this last uh, in this last presentation. So the first thing is um, is how do social scientists, how do scholars uh, think about or define the police arm of government? Uh, they're defined as the coercive arm of the state. They're unique in that they embody the state's monopoly on the use of force as part of the uh, social contract. And what that means is, sorry, I'm trying to figure out some stuff here. What that means is, is essentially we have an agreement that, um, that we can accept police use of force um, and arrest, uh, incarceration, et cetera, so long as we as a community view it as a legitimate uh, action by the government and a legitimate process wherein uh, the, the, the actions of the police are then transferred into the judicial branch. Um, and so that's, that's a big, that's a critical reason for the need to ensure the legitimacy um, of, of the use of force by the government. Now, the functions of the, of the police are both manifest and latent. Uh, some of them are, you know, in, in your face in terms of 
responding to interpersonal violence and property crime and whatnot, and some of the latent purposes are less visible. We're going to focus a little more on the on the manifest stuff today because that's um, that's the kind of action that results in killings uh, due to um, police action and specifically shootings. One of the questions that comes up a lot, I'm sure you've seen it on your Facebook feed or or um, Instagram or TikTok if you're if if you're into that, um, is do police come from slave catchers? Um, do, do, do police have uh, direct and sole roots with slavery? And the answer to that is uh, yes, but there, is, um, th there are additional roots to the development of police forces in the United States. Um, the, the United States is, a, is referred to as a, a set, settler colonial nation. And so the truth about the development of policing is that it was, it was occurring and developing at different parts, at different times and in different parts of the country. And so with regard to the efforts to control African Americans who were enslaved in the South, it, it really wasn't, uh, policing really wasn't um, a result of slavery, rather the freeing of former slaves and an effort to control those persons as, we, as, as our country transferred from slavery into Jim Crow. And so, um, and so that's a, I think that's a, a slightly important distinction, but there are some roots there um, in, in our history with slavery. Um, the second, and, and this is particularly important given regionally where we are, and that is the historical connections to uh, conquest and westward expansion in the frontier. And, and the reason that's important be, is because that was uh, policing action waged against indigenous and Mexican populations. So all of these territories were occupied at that time and, and controlled um, by indigenous persons and the Mexican government. And so the, the creation of police forces were forces that were working in tandem um, with other law enforcement agencies uh, to colonize territories in the West. And, and that's critical to understanding the history of relationships between certain communities of color uh, and the police. And as we get real specific, which I won't do too much, but as we get real specific um, in San Jose and local, um, we do have, for example, in, in uh, St. James Park, a history of actual lynchings of, um, of Mexican nationals in that park. Um, and so that's a, that's a critical component to remember. It's, and and, and as, as to the indigenous populations, I know we had a land acknowledgement this evening. And so again, it's important to remember uh, the context of the relationship of indigenous persons and police forces. Um, and, then, and then the next, uh, the next component is obviously the modernization of, um, of, of different cities coming with industrialization. Uh, all of the big cities started to, to cultivate police forces uh, contemporaneously with, with the proliferation of, of uh, that kind of development. And then finally, um, the, um, the labor movement um, involved a lot of the use of force in order to control and respond to labor unions who were rising up against uh, their employers. And, and so um, agencies like the Pinkertons who were private contractors used by capitalists uh, to control labor. And this happened particularly on the frontier as well. So those are some of the, the, the critical components to the, to the development of, uh, of police forces. And uh, I think that is, is really critical to understanding the relationships historically with various communities. Um, with that, I'll move on to data and of course, this is also an effort to, to stay as objective as possible in terms of measuring um, the breakdown of many of the relationships in different communities of color, um, but also the problems and the fact that a lot of the efforts that we've seen to increase transparency and to change the ways in which um, we, we are able to, you know, like body-worn cameras and whatnot, the, the way we're able to monitor police conduct, haven't really changed some of this data. So uh, the other, you know, as I begin, the other really important component is um, no one no one was really uh, collecting this data until uh, roughly um, roughly 2014 after the, the murder of Michael Brown and at that point the Washington Post realized um, in their uh, in their investigative reporting that the FBI was grossly undercounting fatal police police show shootings by over 50 percent and so they started a, a, a public database of the police shootings. And another thing that they learned is that there are no federal mandates for this, for any of, of, of the, the uh, 
reporting on police shootings, but any related topics as well. And so this is really critical to, to, to think about whenever we're making decisions around police action is uh, not all jurisdictions are collecting data. Those who are, are frequently doing it voluntarily and there are limitations on their voluntary, voluntary um, collection of data. Um, for example, um, the data itself, um, you know, as, as you, you may know, the, the body worn cameras is just a, an incredible volume of data and having to pay for vendors to, to carry that is, is, is a critical obstacle to data collection. Um, but then, you know, um, statistical analysis experts, all of the resources that you need to identify what data should be collected, how it should be organized, and how it should be reported are all obstacles in, in various jurisdictions to, to collecting this data. And so the end result is we don't have enough uh, data. We don't have good data frequently. Um, so, so with that caveat, um, let's look first at national data. Um, and, and we'll let, let me distinguish between killings and shootings. Shootings are obviously um, those incidents where a person dies involving the use and discharge of a firearm. The killings, on the other hand, are deaths that, that occur without the use of a gun. And that can be from what's called a, a control hold um, or some other type of uh, a physical force like we saw um, uh, last year. Um, and and um, and then the, the the control holes are are usually you know choking or, or kind of more deliberate maneuvers that we've seen um, that we've seen frequently. So police have killed this year in 2021 657 people so far. Um, that means there's only been about nine days uh, this year where the police in the U.S. haven't killed somebody. 25% um, of the U.S. Uh, police killings between 2013 and 2020 um, were committed by police departments of the 100 largest U.S. cities. Um, and then Black people were 38% were of the people killed by these departments, even though they only make up 21% of the population. Um, only one, the Department of uh, Police in Irvine, only one of the 100 largest city police departments did not kill anyone from January 2013 to December 2020. 44% um, of unarmed persons um, killed by police were Black, and this was at a rate four times higher than unarmed white people. This is kind of a nuance, but worth pointing out, the rates of violent crime in, in cities didn't determine the rates of killings by police um, and and um, the the fatal police shootings in the u.s are fairly consistent around 1,000 per year this is an interesting this is interesting is that the trend of the number of killings stays even month to month year to year for the periods that data has been collected and and I didn't have a chance to look it up again but um, but I recall the numbers were higher in the early, I believe, uh, four to five months of the lockdown, they were higher than the previous same months. So 2019, I believe, uh, March um, to June were higher than the year uh, before in, in 2019 when, uh, uh, when there was not a lockdown and everybody was home. Um, so really interesting, that's really an interesting aspect uh, of the consistency with which, uh, with which police contact uh, results in death. Um, uh, uh, this is no surprise. Black and, and uh, Latino Americans are, are fatally shot at significantly higher rates than their white counterparts. Latinos twice, uh, just about twice as high as their white counterparts and Blacks at 37 per million versus 15, so even higher. Um, this, is, this is not in this particular presentation, but the Santa Clara County District Attorney's Office does release a report on race and prosecution. And in it, you will find that uh, Latinos are arrested and prosecuted at roughly uh, twice the rate of their population. Uh, so so interesting, um, interesting similarity in some of the, some of the statistics um, that we see in terms of the rates of, uh, of problems. Uh, over 95% of those who are killed are male. 
Um, but that's not to say that there are not significant gender um, or trans um, issues that, that are important to consider. Um, they're just not captured again by, by some of this data. Um, the the uh, Yale and UPenn study here shows that racial disparities in fatal police shootings were unchanged between 2015 and 2020, despite protests and reforms such as um, the widespread use of body-worn cameras. That's just a, another incredible oddity about uh, police behavior, data, and reforms. Um, I, I, I'm sure all of you saw or, or uh, or learned about uh, body-worn cameras and thought that it would make some type of significant difference in the interaction between persons and police. And and this, uh, I mean, I can tell you as a public defender, surprisingly, uh, it doesn't make a big difference. But also, this Yale U Penn study um, um, similarly concludes that that um, that the racial disparities in fatal shootings were not changed um, during that five-year period. Uh, really interesting. Uh, so further looking at uh, people with mental illness, which is another category of persons who suffer uh, harm at the hands of police at high rates, they are 16 times more likely to be killed in an, in an interaction with, with law enforcement. Um, and police are, of course, more likely to kill poor people. And that is that is um, another interesting statistics because it because, because that principle follows irrespective of race. So I can show you a couple uh, a couple charts that, that show that. Uh, this is from um, uh, Prison Policy Institute. It shows um, on this side, this quintile, on this side is the, the, the lowest poverty on the right side. And you can see as the, um, the number of killings per million increase, it, it steadily increases as you move left towards a higher rate of poverty. And then this chart shows um, three groups, white, black, and Latino. And in each one, you see the exact same trend of increase moving left, which is moving towards higher rate of poverty in terms of the, the uh, killings by police. Um, so that's national data. I'm gonna move now to, to state, uh, to, well, to California specifically, and um, look at some of the statistics there. Sorry, I'm, I'm double checking my time here. Um, so California is unique in that police killed far more people here in California in, than in any other state since 2013. Um, and a statistical issue there is that it's not necessarily at the highest rate, uh, which I won't get into because it's a statistical um, issue that I, I shouldn't be talking about. <laughs> um, and here's what that looks like. Um, before we get to the chart, let me tell, let me make sure to, to also confirm in California, Black people and Latino people are also um, uh, more likely to be killed by police. Black people, 3.8 times more likely, um, and Latinx, uh, 1.4 times. And here's the chart that shows, um, on the left, this is the chart that shows California killings um, as compared to any other state, and it's just absolutely, uh, completely um, lopsided and out there ahead of everyone else. Um, and then here, it's, it's, it's not um, quite as prolific. Uh, and this is the rates of killing per proportion of uh, population. California is right in here. Next, we'll look at local data, uh, Santa Clara County, um, and, and this is, we're just going to look at, at a special report from the Mercury News. I did a really good job of, of, um, of taking a, a look at this stuff. And they found that the data suggests that Black adults are 6.6 .6 times more likely and Latino adults 2.2 more likely to be given a local infraction by the San Jose Police Department um, as a result of a non-traffic stop. And so... The reason that's in here, and we'll get later, we'll get to injuries because you know I think frequently we get far too caught up in um, in death and shootings and killings, um, and and minimize some of the disparities that different communities suffer very frequently. Um, and so one is non-lethal injuries, 
Uh, the other is, I mentioned earlier from the pro race and prosecution report, an increase in, in arrests and prosecution generally. And then this, uh, this statistic shows uh, just such a higher rate of being contacted for the lowest type of legal violation, which is an infraction. Um, and this is the, the, the um, diagram from the special report by the Mercury News. And it, I'll let you look at it, but it, it, further, it, it further emphasizes that um, that uh, Black and Latinos in San, in San Jose are more likely to suffer um, harm by either uh, by killing or, um, or or their injury from the San Jose Police Department. Um, mental health is also noted here um, as uh, as a as a um, very common characteristic of persons uh, who ultimately died after contact with the police. This is an interesting uh, statistic where fatal encounters in response to violent crimes, 49 of them were not. Um, and so that tends to suggest an escalation in violence by, um, by, by police who are responding to incident. Um, and then uh, this is another, I'll, I'll point this last thing out here in this middle column here, which shows that the San Jose Police Department had the most fatal encounters during this period from 2015 to 2020 as compared to San Francisco, Oakland, and all these other departments. And that's, that, that's surprising. I mean, I think just in conversation, if you said which police department um, is going to, uh, is going to be chosen as the, as the, you know, just by your, your everyday person as the department that was, that, that was responsible for the most killings, most are going to say Oakland or San Francisco. Uh, but you see San Jose um, is, is more than double Oakland and San Francisco is, is up there with us, but, um, but we are still um, meaningfully higher than them. And then this is the real, uh, this is the real kicker. And, and again, it's really, uh, there's a close nexus to this fact and the overall discussion, the context of what we're talking about, which is the need for increase in oversight. And, and here's the, here's the fact between 2015 and 2020, no San Jose police officer, meaning zero, has been prosecuted for killing someone despite 19 fatal encounters with the police. 15 were people of color, and, and these numbers rank San Jose number one in the Bay Area for fatal encounters with the police. And, and, and so, so this statistic, again, I've said I'm a public defender, this statistic isn't, isn't to say that, that because someone died at the hands of police, a police, officer, a police officer should necessarily be convicted of a crime. But the public is entitled to a process wherein there's a full investigation and uh, an analysis of, of whether or not there's wrongdoing. And there should be more than one agency that evaluates the quality of investigation here because clearly the, 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 the district attorney's office um, has a has a pattern at least over these 19 fatal encounters in this five year period of uh, of of not even um, initiating a prosecution against police officers, uh, and so, uh, so and so I think it begs the question: um, Do we have a sufficiently objective and robust investigatory uh, oversight process um, in the event of, of fatal encounters with the police? And I'd say um, I'd say um, no, we do not. Uh, I'll, let me let me move on now to international comparisons. This is another um, disparity where we just absolutely um, overtake the competition here. Um, U.S. police kill civilians at a much higher rate than police in other wealthy countries. So you see here um, the United States on top, just absolutely um, crushing every other wealthy country. Um, that you compare it to. Now, um, this is a, another the same, I'm sorry, this is rate and this is annual. Either way, the number is just staggeringly higher than any other country. Um, just as a, as a point of clarification, these numbers aren't the highest in the world, um, but, but that's because the people who, um, the countries where they kill more people than we do, are not considered uh, quote unquote first world countries. So countries like Brazil, countries like the Philippines where 
um, they they have an extremely militarized police force, um, and they treat um, and they treat their residents that way. It, some of you may, if you haven't, you can you should Google the New York Times um, uh, kind of video. They had this almost traumatizing um, video piece on the on the way that the Philippine uh, police force deals with drug offenders. Um, they literally just um, um, approach them and, and murder them in the street and leave their body in the street. Um, and the New York Times did an incredible piece where they videotaped a, a lot of that and 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 published it. Really incredible. So, um, so comparatively, it's it's important to to remove uh, police forces like that from the conversation. But even when you do, um, when we look at when we look at this stuff, it, it is just uh, um, absolutely uh, incredible the disparity between the killings in the United States and any other wealthy country. Um, so earlier I mentioned the difference between killings and violence causing severe injury. I do want to touch on that briefly. I think I'm doing okay on time. I'm almost done. Um, and this this shows that uh, according to the CDC, since 2015, more than 400,000 people have been treated in emergency rooms following interactions with police. And um, and according to a Seattle study, stops that involve involve force, more than half of them end with a suspect or bystander being hurt or injured. Um, I will say, you know, again, as a, as a, as a uh, person that works in the criminal justice system, this isn't the highest quality of data because, you know, a lot of people need to go to the hospital um, out of an abundance of caution to get checked out or because they're demanding to. Um, this might not be reflective, for example, of, oh, well, the, you know, the police broke a bone or um, caused a, a severe maiming or whatnot. Um, so that said, uh, any any event for you know your everyday resident that doesn't that doesn't suffer serious violence um, all the time in their life, any event like this um, is going to be a type of traumatic event that's going to leave an emotional scar. Uh, so uh, again, this is this data doesn't reflect all that, but these are things to consider when we're talking about non-lethal. Um, non-lethal result of police contact. Um, something like 1,300 people were sent to the ER after interactions just with San Jose police between 2017 and 2020. And 60% of them were from what I said earlier with control holds, 20% uh, from gunshot wounds and 10% from the use of impact weapons. Um, control holes, by the way, can, can be, uh, they aren't just kind of um, intended to cut someone's air off. They can be they frequently used on, on arms and wrists and whatnot to, to gain compliance. Um, so, so it's not just something that's, um, that's necessarily a, a lethal action. Um, this is another really important fact for this body to consider. Uh, injuries during arrests have cost San Jose over 26 million in lawsuits since 2010. And so um, it speaks volumes about, uh, you know, irrespective of who, you know, what officers got in trouble or suspended or fired or we don't have that data anyways, but uh, this number is, this number is real and speaks volumes about what the city thinks of, of their liability um, because of injuries caused persons uh, by the San Jose Police Department. Uh, San Jose PD has one of the highest rates of those sent to the hospital um, following the use of force incidents. Um, this is this is actually somewhat misleading. I should have said at the beginning of um, of this, this investigative work is was done by um, NBC News and the Marshall Project, and they they focused on San Jose PD um, primar primarily, but that was because San Jose was one of the first. And, and biggest and main departments tracking this information. And so, um, you know, you, you probably, if you ever worked with Chief Garcia, he was uh, not, you know, not afraid of being transparent. He was excited about int introducing um, body-worn cameras. So um, the result is the, the police department got a closer look uh, than others. And so um, even though they are the highest, uh, they, they had the highest rate of violence, they were only of, of nine cities measured because only nine were providing data. Um, and this last part it is, um, is a reference to a video that, uh, that I thought you guys might find helpful. It's a little more dense. That's led by a professor of African-American studies to talk about how social scientists uh, understand the broader history of these movements in response to the patterns uh, of violence that we discussed so far. 
Um, and so that's, uh, that's my um, rendition of Dr. Armelin's um, presentation. Uh, I will say finally, you know, thank you all for your attention and your work on police oversight. This is a critical topic um, and, and it was critical before George Floyd's murder, but now uh, this is the type of thing that, that absolutely, um, absolutely demands action and reform and our best efforts. And I say that as a, as a response to the Jones Jimenez um, memo um, that I think, um, that I, that I think does, does not uh, appropriately recognize the time and attention and value that this body has placed on considering uh, police oversight. Um, and I think their effort um, to, um, to narrow the scope of your work and to prevent you from speaking on the issue um, is, is, is quite inappropriate. And it's not reflective of the messages that the community uh, has, um, ha has put forth. Uh, as, you, as you heard, I, I am involved in the VASA Lawyers, but I'm also on the steering committee of the Reimagining Public Safety Group, and I sit on several other boards and organizations in, in the community. And so I will tell you, uh, this, the City Council tried to do this to Reimagining, and many organizations and many persons in the community responded and said, we want to talk about this. Um, and, and, um, and then you all know the, the City Attorney, Ms. McGuire, wrote a letter to you. Uh, to your chair, um, saying we should narrow the scope, we should not talk about this. And you all said, thank you for your um, input, but we're going to go forward um, to go forward and consider this. We want to speak on it. And for the council members to ignore um, your decision and the public input uh, in the reimagining process, I think it, it is not reflective of, of, of good government, good governing, and good process. Uh, and so I hope that uh, if for no other reason um, you will um, stand in opposition to, to that type of censorship and interference um, so, that, so that your process, your work, uh, your discretion um, is, is recognized by the council. And if the council wants to hear your input and vote against it, that's okay. Um, but I don't think that it's appropriate for the council to censor you before you've had an opportunity to use the information that persons like me and Dr. Armelin and other speakers have provided so that you can make an informed decision that's reflective of the will of the community. So I appreciate your attention and consideration of my, uh, of my thoughts and, and this, this information. I'm available for questions. Thank you, Mr. Yasumera. Questions from commissioners? Commissioner Siegel. Thank you. Thank you so much for speaking, especially after your bout with food poisoning. Um, it's really <laughs> quite a thing that you did for us. So um, we really very much appreciate it. Um, you mentioned that um, city council did this to the um, community with the reimagining process. Could you just give us a quick summary of what you mean by that? Sure. The, the reimagining process um, was, um, it, it, first of all, the reimagining process deals with policy, um, which is distinguished, distinguished from, from what you guys are doing, uh, looking at the charter. Um, and so um, the, the, um, the policy that the, the city council, I, I think, wanted to, um, to focus on was very broad in that instance. And they said, you know, we want to look at policing alternatives, community services, um, and, and they were very unclear about any limitations on scope. And so it wasn't, um, it wasn't clear until after nominations and after the process has started that they said, you are not permitted to discuss reform. And, um, and if you were to uh, make any recommendations related to reform, they would only go to the um, city manager's office, who would then provide them to the chief of police. In other words, they would not be heard by the, by the council. Um, and so it was similarly um, uh, um, narrowing in scope and, and, and it, um, it, the reaction was that um, almost all of the black leaders um, on, the, uh, on the reimagining uh, group and me uh, immediately resigned. Um, and then we were followed by the majority of the, of the reimagining work group. 
Um, and so that's what I mean when I say uh, there was a previous effort um, and um, there was a previous effort and then uh, the public said, no, this is not what we want. Now, equally important is we came back to the table and we, when we expressed our, 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 well, we expressed the need really to be talking about these things and, 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 um, and the city council said, okay. And they voted uh, unanimously to, to allow that conversation. Um, and so um, I find it puzzling that they wouldn't support the same dialogue and analysis for this body, but I can't speak on, uh, on why or how they would, how they would view them, uh, view this body differently than uh, reimagining. Any other commissioners? Seeing none, then I want to say thank you to Mr. Oh, I'm sorry, Commissioner Fuentes. I just wanted to thank you for being with us today and uh, for the work that that you and um, the reimagining re policing uh, committee is doing because um, as as um, Commissioner Siegel has pointed out to us that um, we we are working together with you and also the fact that as you just pointed out we deal with the charter and we are the only ones that are able to address the, the charter question and and absolutely um, I know that we're going to continue doing this work because it was part of our original charge and we're almost at the end of completing this work um, and so we will be continuing and I just really want to thank you Thank you for being in, and it's it's um, shamefully information that we have to look at, but we need to fix it. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Appreciate you. that. Commissioner Matsumura. Yeah, thank you. I just want to echo the appreciation from my colleagues um, to you for for joining us and for the very important presentation. And I was wondering, I know that um, uh, our subcommittee on policing municipal law, accountability and inclusion has been in communication with members of Reimagining Public Safety. Um, but I was wondering while we as the full commission have you here directly, if you could just share a little bit more with us about, uh, in addition to the history that you shared, where the current process is at, um, what its scope is, you know, what kinds of sort of directions and recommendations are emerging. Um, and, you know, anything particularly notable that we should be aware of in terms of what you're hearing from your public engagement. Sorry, that's <laughs> asking for a huge <laughs> process to be <laughs> as best you can. Sure, I'll, I'll take another 30 minutes to answer that one. Um, I'm just kidding, just kidding. I, I, um, the, the, I'll, I'll make a point that you, that you raise as it relates to the Jones Humanities mem memo, which is that that the effort, as Commissioner Puente said, is not duplicative. Uh, there is a clear policy lane for reimagining, and there is a clear um, like charter lane for the Charter Commission. Uh, but we are working collaborative, collaboratively, uh, in as much as um, we are looking at similar content. And our uh, the subcommittee that, that I also sit on uh, regarding accountability reform and, and oversight um, has. Um, has considered um, this oversight issue and, and is working collaboratively um, so that we can align as best we can. Um, but they are certainly different lanes and, and, and the council needs to hear you all speak on, on the issues from your vantage point. With regard to the other policy issues, um, we are at the beginning, very beginning of our process because again, we started all over again. So our persons have been nominated, but we're probably, a year out from from final recommendations, with the possibility of a six month check in, um, and we're and we're just kind of getting started. But our um, our subcommittees reflect all of these different topics, from accountability to police uh, uh, to policing alternatives, uh, to community services, you know, to, to enhancing community services, um, mental health crisis um, crisis mental health services, etc. Um, so. Uh, without getting too much into that, we, we will be doing, uh, you know, a tremendous amount of uh, covering a tremendous amount of ground um, in this in these areas. But we're at the beginning of our process and are just doing our best um, to align with uh, with you all on this one issue, 
given that you're at the at the, the very end of your process um, and, and we're just forming. Thank you. Any other commissioners? Again, seeing none, I want to thank you, Mr. Estimare, for coming tonight. Really appreciate your presentation and your response to our questions. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I hope you feel better. Take good care. Um, uh, thank you to our subcommittee for all these great speakers tonight. Um, we're going to move to a different topic area. Uh, this is the, land, the Native Land Acknowledgement. Um, and I do want to read into the record um, uh, a notion from um, just, uh, I want to read into the record just, to, just in terms of background. Um, reminding us that we had a speaker explain the UN report and how we passed many of them. Um, this was for the next round of speakers for climate change. So you can I'm, hold on reading that sorry, into the record. I'm sorry, you're right. Um, I'm sorry, the next item is native land acknowledgement. I'm sorry, I skipped ahead. Um, and tonight we have two speakers, uh, Gloria Ariano Gomez, who is um, gonna be introducing herself as well as Monica Ariano. Um, two members of the um, Ohlone Tribe Council uh, and the Ohlone Tribe Council for the San Francisco Bay Area. And I'm going to open up the conversation with them. Um, and we have 20 minutes for this topic area. And I don't know, Gloria, are you guys sharing um, or you're going to be speaking in turn? How did you want to work it? Uh, I'll go first. I would like to share a brief historical background of the Moet Maloney tribe. Thank you. So, and then Monica, thank you. Welcome. Okay, thank you. And then Monica, I'll introduce her. So first, I'd like to say Jorge Tuhi, Ganak Gracat Gloria Ariana Gomez, Ganak former Moet Maloney tribe council member, Aye Ganak Nonuente Macolcheno no Machocheno. Hello, my name is Gloria Ariano Gomez, and I am a former Moet Maloney tribe council member, and I also speak our native Chocheno language. I would like to begin by sharing a brief historical background of the Moet Maloney tribe of the San Francisco Bay region. The Moet Maloney tribe is comprised of all known surviving American Indian lineages aboriginal to the San Francisco Bay region. All members trace their, our, ethno-historic origins from the indigenous tribes of the San Francisco Bay Area, who were living on land that they had continuously occupied since before the mission period. Upon arrival of the Spanish in the late 1700s, all Moekma members were involuntarily confined at three Bay Area missions, Mission San Jose in Fremont, Mission Santa Clara in Santa Clara and Mission Dolores in San Francisco. After the secularization of the missions in 1834, most of the mission Indians who were rounded up from outside of the Ohlone speaking territories left the area returning to their non Ohlone villages. But those who remained in former Ohlone speaking territories coalesced into a distinct community living on two Indian rancherias, one in Pleasanton and one in Niles, near Union City, where they were able to revive indigenous cultural practices such as a sweat lodge and ceremonial dances like the ghost dance. They were comprised of those who came from Ohlone uh, speaking villages, but also Miwok, Yokuts, Wapo, and Patwin speaking tribes. These two rancherias were very close to each other and formed a single distinct community that were well known locally. In 1906, Mowekma ancestors were included in the congressionally mandated Kelsey census of landless California bands in need of land. Although the tribe was referred to locally by many names like Mission San Jose Indians, Pleasanton Indians, Ohlone Indians, it was evident that no one from the Indian agency did any research or interviewed any of the members since without informing the tribe or anyone else, in 1914, they labeled the tribe the Verona Band after a nearby railroad station um, located near Phoebe Hearst property. The tribe was listed in 1914 and again in 1927 on the list of tribes to receive land. However, after 1927, without the benefit of a site visit, an Indian agent, Sacramento Superintendent L.A. Dorrington, 
reported to Congress that the tribe was not in need of land and removed Verona Band from the list of tribes to receive land. These two departmental errors of mislabeling the tribe as Verona Band and refusing to buy us a land base that was mandated by Congress was the beginning of our political erasure. Muwekma, like many tribes, has struggled to keep from being marginalized, forgotten, and culturally erased. This was not an accident of history. Again, this was not an accident of history. Extermination of our language, cultural practices, and religious rights was government policy for decades, unfortunately. We have begun healing, excuse me, we have begun the healing of generations of trauma and are finding our voice in the conversation of where and how we fit into the diverse communities surrounding us. Land acknowledgements are very important for the healing process. They recognize the existence of our people, not only that we were here in some distant past, but that we are still here today, alive and thriving. We are stewards of our ancestral land, preserving our connections from past to future generations. Land acknowledgements also recognize and show appreciation for the contributions our people have made to our shared history. Now, I would, excuse me, like to introduce uh, the Vice Chairwoman for the Muwek Maloney Tribe, Monica Ariano, and she will be reading the Muwekma land acknowledgement that we would like to present for the San Jose Charter. Monica? Monica Villariano, Maloney Tribe, San Francisco Bay Area Thought. Good day, I'm Monica Ariano, Vice Chairwoman for the Muak Maloney Tribe of the San Francisco Bay Area. Maki Mak Muwekma Wulbulum, Akoi Makware, Mani Makiswi. We are Muwekma Aloni. Welcome to our ancestral homeland. Muwekma Wulbulum, Warip Tashu. Muwekma Aloni Tribal Land Acknowledgement for consideration for San Jose City Charter in the city of San Jose. Thamian Ancestral Muwekma Aloni Territory. Hoshetuhi. The city of San Jose would like to recognize that it is located on the ethno-historic territory of the ancestral and unceded land of the Thamian Ohlone speaking tribal groups of the greater Santa Clara Valley, which includes the lands of the Alsons, Matatlans, and Paleños, whose tribal region was named after their powerful chief, Capitan Pala, and the two Mexican land grants located in the East Hills above San Jose and who were intermarried with the direct ancestors of some of the lineages enrolled in the Muakmaloni tribe of the San Francisco Bay Area, who were missionized into Mission Santa Clara, San Jose, and San Francisco. The Muakmaloni tribe of the San Francisco Bay Area is the legal successor of all the surviving Native American lineages, including the Thamianaloni speaking tribes who comprise the historic, sovereign, and previously federally recognized Verona Band of Alameda County. This land was and continues to be a great spiritual and historical importance to the Muakma Ohlone tribe and other familial descendants of the Verona Band. We recognize that while every member of the greater San Jose community has and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the city of San Jose's establishment in 1777, Consistent with our values of community, inclusion, and diversity, we have a responsibility to acknowledge and make known through various enterprises the city of San Jose's relationship to Native peoples. As members of the San Jose community, it is vitally important that we not only acknowledge and commemorate the history of the land on which we work, live, and learn, but also we recognize that the Muak Maloney people are alive and flourishing members of the San Jose and broader Bay Area communities today. Aho. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, questions or thoughts from uh, commissioners? Commissioner Siegel. Just wanted to say aho for coming today. Thank you so much. Kishore Chekina, thank you. Commissioner Matsumura, then Commissioner Barosio, then Commissioner Fuentes. Commissioner Matsumura. Thank you. I also want to really, really thank you both. Um, for coming to meet with our commission um, and just for the work that I'm sure it took to so thoughtfully craft that recommended statement for the charter. And I was wondering, you know, it must have taken a lot of work um, and a lot of thought to exactly how to put that together. I'm assuming we're going to get a copy in writing. Um, 
but I also was wondering if you could just share a little bit more about sort of what the thought process was that went in, you know, I'm sure in choosing the language and what to include and what to exclude, just so that we so kind of have the fullness of understanding your rationale in, in making that recommendation and, and um, all of it's, that's behind the, the particular wording that you've recommended. Sure. Um, there is a lot of thought that goes behind putting together a land acknowledgement. Uh, a lot of it's emotional as well, because we have to dig back into the past and acknowledge what happened to our people. Um, they try to, you know, kill us off. So we have to address that in the land acknowledgement in a subtle way. But, um, but we also don't want to forget. And this is part of the truth that we try to tell as far as our history. Um, in the Bay Area, you know, in California in general with the missionization system. Um, but it also talks about our connection to the land and what it means to us and that uh, we never left the area. You know, regardless of what happened to our people, we stayed here. We, you know, we still cultivated the land. We still lived off the land and we survived. Um, generations later, here we are talking, you know, again about the land and what it means to us. So, a lot of it refers to, um, we try to name points, you know, and uh, acknowledge all the, the tribes of the past, the Matatlan, the Palenos, the Alzons, those are all family and speaking uh, Ohlone people. And they're all part of our ancestry um, that comprise the tribe. So we pr try to be inclusive of that and thoughtful. Um, and just remember, a lot of it has to do that you're acknowledging the land where we lived and that we're still living here today and part of the community and we don't want to be forgotten. I just wanted to add that as traditional stewards of the land, um, connected to the land, um, we have a responsibility in just sharing um, our connection through the land acknowledgement and so we connect our ancestors. When we do a land acknowledgement for a city, we connect it, uh, the ancestors that were either missionized in the area. So for example, Santa Clara, uh, we name um, you know, the ancestors, we name uh, specific areas uh, that are important to us in the land acknowledgement. So each one is unique to the city. So we have different land acknowledgements for different cities. So. Thank you, Commissioner Brosio. Perfect, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Ms. Arellano, Ms. Arellano Gomez. Uh, I really appreciate your, your time and statements. Um, I'm wondering if, um, if we would like to do more research, especially um, uh, city institutions and uh, educational um, institutions as well, is there, is there some, um, website, museum, is there something that you can point us to for further research, especially around the primary sources? I think um, it's good to read the research, um, especially documentation done from anthropologists and other folks, but who would you recommend and where would you recommend we look at um, for more detailed information? Thank you. Sure, um, we work with, um... The universities in the Bay Area, Santa Clara University, uh, there's Professor Lee Panage. He actually wrote a book um, that talks about our, our history. It's called Narratives of Persistence. I don't know if you can see this. Yeah, um, but I'll be happy to connect you with our tribal ethno historian, Ellen Leventhal, and he can provide you all the resources um, if you're interested in researching a little bit more about our tribe and learning you know, what we reference as far as our historical um, data and information. Um, we work with Stanford University, the tribal archaeologist, or the campus archaeologist, Laura Jones. Um, since um, part of our responsibility is cultural resources in the Bay Area, we make it a point that we're part of the co-authorship of the, um, the reports that come out of the sites. So we're cited a lot in archeological reports, uh, references our history, our connection to the area, um, our ancestry, basically. Um, we also have a website, moacma.org, uh, that you're welcome to visit. On, in there, we provide timelines, you know, what we mentioned. So this is actually a really shortened version of a land acknowledgement. Usually ours are much longer. <laughs> we go into a lot more history. 
Um, but um, you're welcome to us visit our website. We have a timeline there, as I mentioned, um, just referencing the different important um, time frames in history for our people. Um, yeah. Does that answer your question? Yes, perfect. Uh, you gave me a lot of um, things, and also for the record, I think I think uh, the fact that this is always recorded in YouTube um, and and um, uh, uh, there's something for us to point to, right? For 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 the research. Um, uh, I don't know who in the subcommittee will be taking this on, but but I would recommend give them the full version. Um, of the of the uh, of the land acknowledgement, um, as you've seen, um, or uh, like you may see in our charter, uh, it's pretty wordy, anyways. So, so I would rather have it be as complete as possible. Um, as a city resident, um, if we're going to go there, like let's just go and put it all out there, right? So, um, I would recommend to put it out there for for the um, for the lead commissioner um, in the subcommittee. Thank you. Sure. And Chair, may I just respond to the question? Um, I did, the entire commission was sent a 79 page um, document of Ohlone history. The first time we had our um, speakers on Native American land acknowledgement, it is from a faculty of the department. It was, it was a dissertation uh, to the faculty of uh, Department of Anthropology for San Jose State. It was by um, Alicia Marie Ragland, and it's entitled um, The History, Heritage, and Legacy of the Muwekme Ohlone Tribe of the San Francisco Bay Area. I think if all the commissioners um, look at their emails, they will find that resource as well. Thank you, Commissioner Siegel. I was just about to say the same thing because I thought it was a great article and, and really kind of keeps rounding out this, this topic from an education study session perspective. It's just really been excellent. Commissioner Fuentes. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to to thank uh, Monica Ariano and Esther Ariano Gomez for being here tonight, and um, and thank you for the beautiful land acknowledgement that you shared with us and all the historical information. And um, I know that um, that we're we're definitely going to be taking some kind of an action, and you know I'm I, I'm actually going to ask the the chair or ask. Um, Commissioner Siegel, you know, what are our next steps? Because I know tonight, um, um, I'm, I don't know if we're going to be able to take action tonight or if this is going to be presented at a future meeting um, with a recommendation uh, for adoption of the land acknowledgement. But um, I'm very excited and looking forward to that day when we do take action, but I just don't know the process. And so it's, I guess it's more of a question than a statement that, I, that I'm trying to make right now. If thank I you, may, I believe it's Monday that we're presenting. Yeah, thank, you. thank you, Sorry. Commissioner Fuentes, for the question. This is a study session tonight, so right. there are no actions, but it is being taken up at our regular meeting on Monday. On Monday, uh, okay. So, yeah. Okay, that, that was just my question. I wanted yeah, to. Okay. Definitely. Uh, Commissioner Callender. I just want to say, uh, Vice Chair Ariano, good to see you again, and thank you for appearing tonight. Look forward to continuing the partnership and work with you. Thank you so much. Nice to see you too. Seeing no further commissioners questions, I wanna thank both of our guests tonight for your thoughtful presentation. Again, helping us to really understand stuff that we hope we should all be understanding and understanding and from a common experience. So uh, thank you again for being here tonight and for all your support of our work. Thank you. That means goodbye. <laughs> Bye. Um, next, I'm going to move us to our next topic, which is a different topic again. Um, this is a topic on artificial intelligence. And I'm going to ask Commissioner Percival for just um, the context piece. Yeah, great. Uh, thank you, Chair Furr. Um, uh, and thanks, everyone. Uh, I also wanted to just uh, Thank uh, Commissioner Siegel and everyone on the Policing and Municipal Law Accountability and Inclusion oh. Subcommittee for uh, asking uh, to to look into this more. This this particular issue, artificial intelligence, um, really is a result of of uh, community input, community feedback, uh, asking the commission to 
uh, look into this a bit more. Of course, we are late in late in our work, um, but um, I have uh, been working on this for for just a bit. But also sort of seeking out uh, experts uh, on this topic. And but the idea that the the the, the commission uh, may be able to provide not through a charter uh, um, amendment uh, or recommendation, but uh, through a uh, a recommendation, a uh, policy recommendation to the city council about how to think about artificial intelligence, but more broadly sort of technological change and what it means for uh, our economy, for particular inequality, which we've been talking a lot about and equity, uh, perhaps even uh, things like policing, which we, we've talked about. Um, and what kinds of things aren't we thinking about uh, on these issues that maybe we should be thinking about? So uh, given the, the limited amount of time we have to talk about this and this can get really technical I wanted to turn to uh, one of uh, one of my colleagues uh, Dr. Lawrence Quill who's uh, written and studied on this um, who I think can provide us, provide us some some uh, broad overview of some of these uh, topics and and issues on, on on this particular issue so I believe uh, Dr. Quill is here is he I can't see on my screen but this um, I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Quill okay um, thank you, uh, Professor Percival. Good evening to everybody. Thank you so much for inviting me along. I'm delighted to talk to you about this topic. I promise not to bore you to tears. Over the next 10 to 12 minutes, I will try to keep this interesting and lively. Um, it's a topic I've thought about for some time now, and I'm, I'm interested in it. Although, uh, whether or not I have any firm conclusions on the matter, well, we'll wait and see. So, uh, with your permission, I'm going to share my screen with you. I did throw together a little presentation because I thought perhaps uh, some pictures along with my chatting might be useful. So I will try to make this as smooth a transition as I possibly can. All right, so thank you for your patience, everybody. And there we have it. Okay, so hopefully everybody can see that and they can still hear me. All right. So here I am and delighted to talk about smart cities and AI. That is a picture not of a smart city, that is a picture of a bookstore. And we will come back to that in due course. So um, thank you, Garrick, for uh, sort of setting me up uh, this evening. Um, I think these are the questions that you just sort of um, discussed and talked about. So I thought we'd, we'd just throw those up there um, because this is what I'd like to talk about. I'm gonna talk about what AI is how it might shape the future of a city like uh, San Jose, how it might affect issues around individual privacy or inequality, both. And then of course, what are we not thinking about that we should? It's fair to say that San Jose is not the only city in the United States or in the world that's thinking about these things. Pretty much any large conurbation that has any ambitions of growth or wants to be part of the future, that's normally how it's pitched, will be thinking about these issues in some form or another. Okay, well, I am a political uh, theorist by training, which means that I read an inordinate number of books and articles in dusty libraries, and that means that I'm obsessed with words and meanings. But I do think that there's something really important that we could just think about um, before we get going, which is the difference between machine learning and AI, because these are often talked about as though they're the same thing, and they're not. So I've gone to Webster's, and here we have a definition of machine learning. The process by which a computer is able to improve its own performance by continuously incorporating new data into an existing statistical model very technical definition artificial intelligence on the other hand defined as an area of computer science that deals with giving machines the ability to seem like they have human intelligence and that's a subtle but important difference machine learning is very technical but ai is in many ways a bit of a shell game. It's, it's, it's some of the earliest experiments in computer science and artificial intelligence were about tricking and fooling people into thinking that they were speaking to a computer. Now that might, sorry, to a human being. Uh, now that might seem like a very trivial thing, but it's really, really important. And I'll explain why as we, um, as we sort of move on. Um, one of the major reasons is of course, hype, the hype surrounding new technologies. Um, but I think the other reason to think about this definition is because it, it poses a really big problem for anybody involved in the political process. So public servants broadly, because if AI, which simulates human intelligence by employing machine learning, can seem to do a better job than public servants, then why on earth do you need public servants? And here's an article that speaks to that point, because they're having this conversation in Europe. 
Now, that's not intended to be provocative or insulting to this commission at all. Um, the fact is that in this country in particular, since at least the 1930s, the idea of getting technology to do the job of public servants, basically doing away with politicians for one reason or another, has been regularly dis uh, discussed by philosophers, but also by engineers. Engineers love this because they have the idea, and they're onto something, I think, that the modern world, a modern city, is too complicated for public servants to properly manage and govern. And if they're right about that, then of course that brings up the, the whole issue of why you need politicians at all. Okay, let's turn our attention to San Jose in particular. Now, San Jose is in the middle of Silicon Valley, and it has for a long time been regarded as a bedroom community with rather poor Wi-Fi. Other cities in the area have attracted all sorts of technology companies, but this city has until recently kind of lagged behind for one reason or another. Now, smart city San Jose and artificial intelligence advocates want to change all of that, I think. And this is important because the population of San Jose is predicted to increase by something like 40% by 2050. I've seen 2040 or 2050, but we know it's going to um, increase dramatically. Smart city advocates, and there are lots of them, describe then the economic benefits to employing smart technologies. And they reimagine the city as what they call a startup machine, which is really, really exciting, of course. And then, of course, there's a lot of other discussion around smart cities, like how you can make smart cities environmentally sustainable or healthier for people. And then there are those people who also think that AI will reduce crime rates. And of course, that's a very, very controversial topic. And things like traffic congestion, which, of course, nobody really likes sitting in a traffic jam. And of course, improving the efficiency of public services more broadly. There is enormous pressure on um, people working in government to turn their cities into smart cities. This is really a major, major industry now, not just here, but around the world. Everybody is doing it. And most of us have already been exposed to smartness in some form in a city in the form of sensors, solar street lights, vending machine restocking. And in some cities, there are even happiness sensors. I'll talk more about that in just a moment. So let's move on because I know that we're pushed for time uh, to the next couple of questions. How might these sorts of issues, which are very big, and they can be rather complicated to understand, how do we imagine they will affect individual privacy or inequality? And what are we not thinking about that we should? Well, I don't think it's a question of whether these technologies will affect privacy or inequality, but how they will. If we take a look at uh, what uh, happened um, to San Francisco, when tech companies moved from Palo Alto in the early 2000s. And what is happening in some parts of Oakland now, the benefits are obvious, but with success comes neighborhood change, gentrification is the word, and of course the displacement of people, often poor communities, people of color. The conflict between community members and the tech workers on the Google bus in San Francisco wasn't just national, it was international news. And that, were, uh, that ran for quite a long time and was rather embarrassing. With respect to privacy, I think the issue is this, and this is a slightly controversial point of view, but it's my own and just my own. Um, I think people are surprisingly willing to trade personal privacy for a service. I think that's the great lesson of growing up in the formative years of the internet, uh, which is what I did in a way by living here in Silicon Valley. And it explains why so many Silicon Valley companies are so unbelievably wealthy. Until fairly recently, the issue over privacy was largely a non-issue. But now it is, because of course in California, we have this lovely thing, a data privacy law passed in 2018, and we've all been exposed to its effects. It gives people the opportunity to opt out of certain kinds of data collection. Now, how effective this law actually is, is a matter of debate. But the question that will arise in the context of smart city San Jose, may be how you give consumers or citizens the option to opt out of their personal information being used if they, for example, sit on a bus or visit the public library, even if the information collected is supposed to improve public services. So let's give this some context because I realize that what I've just said might sound a bit weird. So one of the smartest cities in the world is Dubai, located in the Middle East, in the UAE, the United Arab Emirates. And smart Dubai, which is a government initiative, offers to design new cities to specification. 
for different nations around the world. They've built some in India already. It's kind of amazing. The platform that they use to build cities is actually the iPhone. So they're kind of building cities from that kind of infrastructure all the way up. It's extraordinary. Now, what this includes in Dubai is the widespread surveillance of citizens, monitoring online sentiment and expressions so or reading texts, and happiness. In fact, Dubai has what they call a happiness agenda, which is supposed to impact all areas of public policy and spending, such as education, roads, health, policing, and transportation. This requires almost complete surveillance, which might make us, living in a slightly different political configured country, uh, a little uncomfortable, at least at the moment. And let's not forget, of course, with respect to inequality, that um, Dubai, a very smart city, I mean, look at how high tech it is, that's how they present themselves. Um, this kind of happiness index that they have does not extend to uh, the many tens of thousands of guest workers who are resident outside of Dubai, uh, the people, in fact, who build the city uh, and who live, and this is true, um, Amnesty International has done reports on it and all sorts of things, they live in guarded shipping containers. It's a pretty miserable life, frankly. So this is the flip side of the smart city. Um, so a happiness index then is something to consider for the future, but perhaps not the too distant future. There are already lots of interested parties that are trying to work out what people really want rather than what they say they want. So let me explain what I mean by that. Because you see this approach across the social sciences in a place like San Jose State University, for example. Thanks to uh, behavioral economics, which combines psychology, psychological insight and economic theory, um, think tanks and policy centers around the world now urge the use of nudges. And that's based on the title of this book that was written by uh, Richard Thaler, uh, who won the Nobel Prize in Economics for his work uh, in 2017 on this combination of psychology and economic theory. A nudge is a psychological prompt. It's a little push. It's the sort of thing back in the 60s that people would have talked about, and they would have talked about quite skeptically if you went into a supermarket and you smelt roast chicken, for example. Because if you go into a supermarket and you smell chicken, you think, well, I'm hungry, I, I should buy some chicken, or I should buy something else. So the idea was you're being manipulated and people were very up in arms about that. Well, today, all right, it's far more sophisticated than that. And the nudges might come across through an app on your smartphone. And it's about behavioral change. Now, that isn't meant to sound creepy because all sorts of think tanks and polish the um, uh, initiatives use psycho uh, psychological prompts to promote um, health, for example, healthy living. Um, there are psychological prompts that you might have seen if you've gone to a hotel and there's a sign in the bathroom about where to leave your towels. You know, if you want them to be reused, then you put them somewhere. If you want them to be taken away, you put them somewhere else. So that cuts down, of course, on, on um, you know, kind of cleaning costs and that sort of thing. Uh, my favorite example is the reduction of littering in Texas. So in Texas, they had a terrible problem with littering. They brought in psychologists and behavioral theorists to identify who was doing the littering. And surprise, surprise, it was probably a, a, a male who liked country music, who was aged between 18 and 35, who drove a pickup truck. Now, um, that probably, I wouldn't have thought, narrowed down uh, the actual target audience too much in Texas, but um, so effective was the campaign they launched, which appealed to irrationality. So they, instead of kind of beating people over the head saying, don't litter, that's bad, they said, isn't it great to be proud of Texas? If you're proud of Texas, you won't litter. And they kind of did all sorts of really interesting advertisements and commercials around that. And well, there you see the numbers, it works. It works really effectively. Now, companies such as Amazon, Apple, Facebook, IBM, Walt Disney, investing in these kinds of technologies and in other technologies as well, called emotion recognition technologies. It's kind of the next step up. Because of course, if you use a phone, you have a camera that can read your face and it can work out whether you're smiling or frowning and so on and so forth. The holy grail then, I would say, of smart city technology is this. Ubiquitous, that means constant data collection, delivering real-time information about citizens, their desires and emotions. This, I think, is something to ponder, because what will people who work in cities do with all that data that they have? How much attention will they pay to how it's collected and it's analysed? So let's go back to the beginning. 
with what I said about the difference between AI and machine learning, and of course the role of public servants, who wish to serve all their constituents, not just the ones who voted for them, how to determine what's in the best interests of San Jose. Well, there's nothing especially smart about what I'm gonna suggest. These are all pretty obvious things, I think. And the last thing I want to do is to tell you how to think or what your job should be or any of those things. All right, and if I offended anybody at the beginning by making that slight dig about public servants, I'd cheerfully withdraw that comment. So let's have a look at what I think we need to be. Uh, skeptical. Skeptical about technical solutions to political problems. So let's put that in context. You probably all remember hearing about Smart City Toronto in Canada. It was part of a major vision for the future of cities designed from the ground up by a company called Sidewalk Labs, which is an arm of Alphabet, which is Google's parent company. The new city would have heated roads, autonomous vehicles, wooden skyscrapers, and thousands and thousands of sensors and cameras monitoring millions of people in their daily lives in an attempt to create an utterly frictionless environment. That's the word that's often used. And the fact is that the people of Toronto rejected it. They were worried about privacy concerns and the vision of the future that seemed to have been designed by engineers for engineers. It was a vision of consumption, convenience, absolutely, and policing. Now, you and, I might, uh, you and I may differ over this interpretation of events, but the fact is that Google is no longer involved in this particular project. And Toronto, after all of that really bad PR for the city, recently announced it was looking for a different vision, one that provides beauty as well as utility. That's a very underused word, I think, beauty. Wouldn't it be nice to live in a San Jose that was actually beautiful? Well, I think it probably would. All right, let's think about something else. Involving people. So back to the bookstore. Smart city initiatives will work if there is buy-in from effective, uh, affected constituents who have local knowledge. They live there, they know about their neighborhoods, they know it better than anybody with a PhD in computer science, I would say. Now, of course, if you do get buy-in from local communities, that's great PR for politicians, that's because that means that everybody's working together. And community involvement means adding local knowledge to technical knowledge. Now, the problem with that, of course, is it will slow things down. It also means that things don't always go to plan. But I don't think that that's necessarily a bad thing. And at this point, I'm going to show my age. If you remember bookshops, as I know I do, the joy of browsing in a bookshop, as anyone who reads will tell you, used to be that you found the book next to the one that you thought you wanted. See, even in a bookstore, you could be spontaneous. Now, democracy is, I think, rather similar. It's not efficient. It is what gives life to a city. I think that politicians, people on this commission, can do something that very clever engineers can't. I think that they can bring different groups of people together who might all have good ideas, but might be pulling in different directions. Affordable housing advocates, for example, and environmentalists. A really smart city would employ the sensible use of technology and marry it with a thoughtful and clever vision of what's actually in the public interest. That doesn't always mean the latest whiz-bang piece of technology. Next suggestion. Use independent monitors to assess the impacts and successes of technology. That would be a major impressive move if anybody was actually brave enough to make it because it would deflect the often voiced criticism that the people who would often assess the effects of technology are the people who are selling you the technology. So having independent assessment of how it's working, where it's not working, is probably a really good idea. And then finally, focusing on transparency and trust. And I know a lot of other speakers have talked about that this evening, so I won't make the point. But the fact is, of course, you can't take any of these things for granted, especially when it comes to technology, because technology is very often like magic. We don't really understand how it works, but we really like what it does. And that is hiding behind the curtain, and that's not a good thing. Fortunately, local politicians are generally trusted in this country much more than people that work at the state or federal level. So the people in San Jose already have that ace up their sleeve. People trust them, which is nice. San Jose has another really good thing going as well, which is that they're working on a digital privacy charter. Now, when I tried to find the link for that before this meeting tonight, I noticed that the link was broken. So perhaps somebody's working on that right now. I don't know. But the fact is right now, there are lots and lots of cities out there and lots of national governments working on privacy charters 
They're trying to get ahead of the problems that are coming down the road without throttling innovation. And that's a very difficult balancing act, but I think it's worth thinking about both sensibly and creatively. Thank you very much. I'll try to stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Dr. Quill. Is there questions from commissioners? <clears throat> Commissioner Siegel, Commissioner Barosio, Commissioner Siegel. Thank you. Um, have you studied how often, um, so how, how do you propose, for example, our city council in San Jose um, learns about or thinks about technology and artificial intelligence? How often should they be uh, meeting to discuss policy? Who should they be getting information from to give them updates as to what artificial intelligence is doing, what, what the status of it is, its risks, benefits? Um, can you speak to those questions, please? Sure, I can certainly do my best. I think that's really kind of the, the crux of my, my whole little presentation that I was trying to, trying to offer. The fact is, and again, I say this with the greatest deal of respect, Politicians are not necessarily PhDs in computer science. So um, when a technologist comes to a city and says, look what we can do, look how we can make things better, that's an amazingly appealing and attractive thing to be offered. And that's fine because, of course, I think everybody's on the same page. They want to work to make a city better in some way. But I think there are two components there. Better how, what does that mean? Better for whom, right? And of course, how, how do we know that it's actually making things better and so the people that really could benefit from this technology are actually benefiting from it. So that's why I think marrying local knowledge with technical expertise, having communities talk to, talk to experts all the way through the process is a really, really good idea. You get buy-in from those communities and also engineers start to understand what exactly the, the problems are that they're dealing with. It's not gonna be a one size fits all. Of course, one size fits all is cheaper if you can do that. So your business model will be wonderful. But no two cities are alike. And so that will slow things down. But it, it will, I think, in time, make things a little bit better. So that would be what I would suggest as a beginning, as a beginning. Thank you. Commissioner Brosio. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Quill, for, for your um, presentation. Uh, you mentioned that Toronto tried mm -hmm. to be innovative in this space um, and it intersected with policing. Um, mm -hmm. And tonight we've we've been hearing a lot about um, uh, like just that. Um, so it's very interesting how you have referenced that in terms of AI and policing. Can you say a little bit more in terms of what did Toronto not like about that? And what are some things that you think um, they do like a, that uh, in terms of Dubai, right? Um, uh, I bet they have some sort of algorithm where people feel safe, they're happier. But how does that intersect with policing? And what are some things that we need to be thinking about in terms of if this, if this is direction we want to go in, um, what are some things to keep in mind before, before we dive right in? Mm. Thank you. Yeah, well, that's okay. That's very good. Thank you for the question. I'm, 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 both uh, questions are really interesting. Thank you. Um, Smart City Dubai is an interesting place. Um, it's clean. It's orderly. Um, it feels like a city of the future. And perhaps it is. It also feels rather sterile and inhuman. You lack the spontaneity there that you might find in an American city in a great neighborhood or a European city. Um, it feels like you're walking around uh, a computer simulation. Maybe that's preferable. It certainly might be easier to administer and organize. I guess the big question here, and I'm afraid it's a philosophical one, and my background in part is in philosophy as well as politics, so I'm always going to end up boring somebody to tears. But, you know, it's uh, what, what do you want your city to actually be about? Should it reflect the character and the interests of all of the different people there? Or do you want it to be run in the most efficient way possible, because I don't think that those two things necessarily meet. I think that they might be opposed. 
I think exciting places to live are spontaneous. I think utterly organized places to live feel a little bit like walking around in an open prison. And so you always want to try to imagine what the goal is for the city. Now, with respect to policing, this is all very, very tricky. What we know about policing, what we know about a lot of algorithms that have been used in the past, I mean, a great efforts have been made to try to make these less biased, but there's been a great deal of biased um, programming. Because um, even though I heard, I heard Professor Condoleezza Rice say this a few weeks ago, actually, she said in a talk that she was giving that technology was neutral. I respectfully disagree. Technology is not neutral. Tech, uh, if anybody's ever found a left uh, uh, a can opener for left-handed people, I bet you haven't. You know technology is neutral. They're normally for right-handed people. So there you go, right? It's designed with particular audiences in mind. And while that's true for a can opener, it's true for bicycles, it's true for pretty much everything. And that includes software. And the thing about software is we don't know, most of us, how it works. We just see the GUI. We see the user interface. We look great. We have no idea what it's doing. With policing, there's been a great deal of discussion about predictive policing, about what, what algorithms can be used so that you can identify hotspots in advance. This sounds really kind of amazing, real sci-fi stuff. I even read a report somewhere on the San Jose City uh, website about this, about some of the things that were factored into algorithms way back in 2000, so 20 plus years ago about how uh, you could identify hotspots in neighborhoods. And one of the, one of the uh, variables factored into algorithm use was, and I don't believe that this is used anymore, right? Because I think this, this was too controversial for words, but it was, you could tell that somebody, or it was, it was overall statistically probable that if somebody had had a difficult birth, they were more likely to become involved in a crime at some point in their future. Now, of course, that sounds, kind of odd and weird it's rather like saying well because because i was i was you know i was born in england on a saturday at 1 30 in the afternoon i ended up with rather strange facial hair at this point in my life i mean it's just what are you talking about there is a great temptation to collect as much data as possible try to find patterns that then are meaningful and then rely on people to make judgments about what to do I, th I think this is a mistake. I think the role of public servants is to have a vision of what they think their city ought to be like in consultation with people, rather than have the technology drive them towards a predetermined end, which will always be collect more data, engineer kinks out of the system, have a, uh, an efficient you know, administrative space to manage, because that will be easier to manage. It might well be but it might also be rather sterile and not very beautiful, in my view. It's not a view shared by everybody, of course. And a lot of people have a great deal of stake in smart cities, and they earn a great deal more money than me. But because I don't, of course, I can just be a grumpy old man about it. But no, I, I think cities are more than that. And I actually believe in, in, in you know, public service. And I think that people on committees like this and, and public servants, I think, have a special skill set that technologists don't have, nor do I think that they understand what they're missing most of the time. I think as a public servant, you exercise judgment. You're not just looking for the most efficient answer possible. All right, you have to think about all of your constituents. Anyway, sorry, I'm, <clears throat> it's a bit of a bugbear, so I apologize. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Quill. Appreciate your thoughtfulness and certainly helping us to think through one huge issue. I appreciate uh, Dr. Bursaville um, inviting you tonight um, and thank you for your, your, your thoughtfulness and joining us tonight. You're very gonna, welcome. Thank you. I'm gonna move us to our last um, topic and I wanna read into the record um, just from the, the, the subcommittees reminding us of a few things. Um, first that we had the speaker explain the UN report and how uh, we've passed many of the markers from a, for, in terms of a tipping point. Uh, we had a local speaker talk about the impact of climate change, and we had a speaker describe how climate change commission is in the charter in, in Oahu, Hawaii. And now we have two speakers tonight who are going to give examples of local residents who might be on a climate crisis action committee, Remind, remembering the, uh, the Hawaii model with the commission. Um, and these would be two examples from the subcommittee about 
the type of folks that would serve on, a, on this commission. Um, I believe we have um, uh, Meredith Muller um, and Catherine Matheson, and I'm sorry, I don't have the descriptions of their titles. So um, Commissioner Siegel, do you wanna do that or do we want them just to introduce themselves? They can introduce themselves, thank Perfect. you. Perfect, thank you. Um, so welcome to Meredith Muller and Catherine Matheson. Thank you so much for joining us. And um, uh, Meredith, if you wanna start off, uh, hello, my name is Meredith Muller, and uh, I'm a middle school science teacher. Uh, first, I want to thank you all for your time this evening. We have been here several hours, and I appreciate your time. You have volunteered both tonight and throughout the year to help make the city better. Uh, my name is Meredith Muller, and I'm here to address you today as a climate-concerned citizen. I want to tell you a bit about my journey in reducing my own carbon footprint and then urge you to vote to amend San Jose City Charter to address climate change impacts through establishing a climate crisis action commission uh, so that San Jose residents such as myself can have a role to help reduce the carbon footprint of our city as a whole. Uh, I'm an example of a San Jose resident who would be more than enthusiastic about volunteering my time to research and make policy recommendations to the city council through this commission. Uh, I was born in San Jose in this very house to parents who moved here from the Midwest. My mom, Carol, worked at the Mercury News and my dad, Rich, was a family practitioner. When they moved here in 1980, they uh, brought their Midwestern value of strong community mindedness with them and raised my brother and I to do the same. If I were to tell the story of my environmentalism, it would start with my parents, both raised on farms, it was common for us to spend summer afternoons canning grape jam from the vines in the backyard, uh, practicing archery into a hay bale or collecting fallen walnuts. As a young adult, I worked for a family in Denmark as an au pair, and I was surprised that a family of five plus me, they would generate only one grocery bag of kitchen garbage in a week, and that when the family had a party, the soda and the beer came in a big crate of glass bottles that would go back to the producer to be refilled. Uh, after graduating college, I worked as a cook at a vegetarian international boarding school in England, and I learned how to make my own yogurt and bread, which I do all myself. I was confused uh, when it was time to make sandwiches for a hike in the first week that I worked there because I hadn't seen any plastic wrap or Ziploc bags in the kitchen. And how would the children package their food? I learned that we saved our plastic from the pasta that we cooked and that the cereal we served at breakfast, we also kept those bags. And you know, even without a Ziploc, a bag is a plastic bag is a plastic bag is a plastic bag. In graduate school, I studied STEM education in Maine and was fascinated with the bottle deposits there. Uh, as a child, I didn't really understand the purpose of the California five cent label on cans. Um, like most people in San Jose, my family had always tossed those in with the rest of the recycling. Um, but there was a local bottle deposit in every town in Maine and it was staffed by people, uh, not machines. I also went to the Common Ground Country Fair and attended seminars on green cemeteries and raising rabbits for meat and I bought my first seed garlic there. When I moved back to San Jose five years ago, I started teaching science to middle schoolers and I also became more and more involved in practicing permaculture. My students often don't know this word and so we learn about it together. We notice that perma is the same stem word as permanent and the culture part could be related to both agriculture and human culture. Uh, permaculture, then, is the goal of creating long-term system sustainability, that is, permanent culture. This systems thinking approach leads to us to dissect our relationship with waste. Instead of learning only the three R's of reduce, reuse, recycle, I teach the four R's of refuse, reduce, reuse, recycle, and that this is a hierarchy where recycling is the easiest low-hanging fruit of environmental action and refusal and reduction of problematic consumer goods is varsity level practicing of environmental action. We also take action with the fifth R, rot. My students just finished building a three heap compost system for turning our garden and food waste into garden gold. Our permaculture learning actually extends beyond the science classroom as well. When we are learning about diversity, equity, and inclusion, we learn that one important aspect of our identities is that we are human. 
um, our species membership can be tough to grapple with when we think about marginalized groups within our species. Uh, but we live in a society that is discriminatory based not only on things like race, gender, ability, socioeconomic status, and sexuality, but also very broadly values human life, human ways of knowing, and human culture above those of other species. This is to the detriment of our shared planet. My students are often surprised to learn about some of the personal choices that I'm that I make to help uh, me align my actions with the concerns that I have for the waste that we put into the world and the impact that our choices have on other species. Things like, I haven't bought any plastic bags, like Ziplocs, garbage bag liners, shopping bags in years. Uh, they are literally everywhere and all you have to do is save them. I line dry all of my clothing because using a dryer consumes five times as much energy as a washing machine even those energy efficient ones. And I use only bar and powdered soap as even as shampoo, uh, both to reduce shipping weight and to avoid chemical ingredients, which do not biodegrade. I collect rainwater and store about 2000 gallons for summer uses in the garden. In this past storm, I collected 550 gallons and pumped it this morning. This year, I finished my gravity-fed drip irrigation system, and I used it to grow my fifth generation of garlic. I am garlic sovereign. I uh, grow all of the garlic that I need. And as a start, I, uh, oh, as I start to see more and more leaf piles in the street, I know that it's time to harvest this resource. Every year, I haul the leaf piles of my neighbors into my backyard, where I grind them up and have mulch ready for spring planting. Also, since winter is coming, it's time to get out the electric blankets and heating pads. I keep the thermostat set low or off and use personalized localized heaters to just uh, heat the area that I'm inhabiting. So much as my students turn off a light when they leave the room, I turn off the heat as well. Ever San Jose proud, I love that eBay has a search function for used and search within 50 miles of my zip code, and it makes it really easy to find something I need without buying new or buying halfway across the globe. While I do still drive a car, it is a 1993 model because I believe the longer that something is useful, the less it needs, the, the fewer new things need to be made. Um, this is perhaps the sixth R, which is repair and not replace. In addition to getting to school, I use my car to volunteer with an organization called Peninsula Food Runners. I taxi food waste from places of waste to places of need. And my impact report on their website tells me that I have diverted 10,540 pounds of waste from landfills this year. That's the equivalent of removing 27 cars from the road for a month. When I think about my environmental responsibility as a citizen, I think of what a local historian taught me a couple of years ago, um, that the Valley of Heart's Delight was the world's largest ever contiguous orchard. Eight million individuals lived here, apricots, plums, cherries, and apples. Eight million, that is eight times as many trees as there are currently people living here. I also often think about what I have learned about native food plants and pyroecology from the Amamutsun, that's a local tribe south of the Muwekma Ohlone territory. And I've learned from them that plants and animals are family too, and that how we treat the land determines what gifts we can receive from the land. Being an environmentalist to me exists on a continuum. There's always something more that I could do, some habit I could change that would make my carbon footprint smaller. And it's important not to spend too much time uh, feeling bad about actions that you have not yet taken that are further along this continuum. And it's just as important not to personally goad others into choices that they haven't yet taken for themselves. Um, but it is absolutely crucial to recognize that carbon neutrality or even aspirationally net carbon negativity is not accidental. Uh, no one in San Jose can live carbon free without intending to do so and without community support. I love that I live in a place where I have access to many of the tools that I need to live like a plant. Uh, that's getting my needs met in one place. 
but I want to urge you today to vote to amend the San Jose City Charter to address climate change impacts through establishing a climate crisis action committee. Because as you well know, and you've heard from many other speakers, the change that is needed is drastic and making individual change is not enough to get there. There are many people in our city who are like me, living small and wasting little, and we are an untapped resource. We have investigated and remedied to the best of our ability, our choices, and we are ready and looking for ways to absorb the footprints of others. Um, I urge you to please vote to accept our help. Um, as an aside to address the current politicking of this charter review body and to which the next speaker, Catherine Mathewson, will be speaking more extensively, I wanted to bring up a memo that Vice Mayor Chappie Jones and Councilmember Sergio Jimenez has circulated to try to derail this Climate Crisis Action Committee. Um, so Jones and Jimenez want the city council to vote to censor your charter review commission with respect to key topics of, the, of this commission in addition to police oversight. Um, their argument is that discussing climate change at the charter level would be redundant with the city's climate smart program. From my understanding, the climate smart program is primarily focused on electrifying homes, businesses, and our transportation system, which is thoroughly laudable. Uh, but it also leaves uh, much else to be done towards carbon neutrality or ideally carbon negativity. Of the nine strategies of the Climate Smart Program, none of them are focused on waste reduction and management, water reclamation, uh, or decreasing agriculture and, and raw material CO2 emissions that our community produces and imports from near and far. The public facing portion of the Climate Smart Program, the, Cli the San Jose Climate Smart Challenge, has enrolled only 69% of its thousand household goal for the year. And if they were on track to hit that goal, they would have needed an 83% enrollment by this time. Uh, the Climate Smart Challenge additionally has achieved only 46% progress towards a goal of 250 tons of CO2 reduction this year. And that represents about 30 cars taken off the road for one year. That is to say that if the Climate Smart Program, they, they set a goal for themselves, for the general public to reduce carbon emissions by only 60 cars off the road for the year. Um, so my question is, how can the proposed Climate Crisis Action Commission be redundant when our current efforts are very clearly insufficient? In addition to the non-duplicative nature of the proposed Climate Crisis Action Commission, um, their letter also attempts to solve a problem, or this, this, this body, the Climate Crisis Action Commission, also attempts to solve a problem of our city government, uh, which is having little accountability to the citizenry. There are co public commenters and activists at the council open office hours, council meetings, planning meetings, and so on, who are continually bringing up common sense measures to improve our city in terms of its climate policies. And these typically fall on deaf ears and no action is taken by council. The Climate Crisis Action Commission puts some measure of power back in the hands of citizens in terms of policymaking. And in this plan, council still has the authority to vote down policies that they do not want to see enacted, but they cease to have the authority to ignore their constituents. I hope you vote to include uh, this Climate Crisis Commission in your charter review recommendations uh, for the genuine reason that it is needed and to disregard the disingenuous efforts of Jones and Jimenez to limit the scope of your mandate. Um, I, again, I thank you for your time and your diligence efforts serving on this commission. I'm sorry, I brought no slides. I thought this was going to be like the other meetings where I just talk into a hole and there is no response, but I suppose we will have questions later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Muller. Um, and now Catherine Matheson. Catherine? Now can you? Yes, we can. Okay. Okay. Um, Thank you. Um, I've got two, two, uh, two computers on. Uh, you need to turn one off because you're echoing. Okay. Let's just 
turn this one off. Turn I'm this sorry. One I'm, off. Not I'm very, sorry. I'm not a very good person. good Sorry. I'm not a very good Okay. Can you hear me now? You're still echoing. You need one. There you go. Try now. Now you're on mute. Okay. That's better. There you go. Okay. Yes. You are muted. Well, you're how doing... do I get unmuted? Catherine, you're doing fine. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, thank you, Meredith, for your uh, your thoughts. Uh, we have a similar uh, history in that I also am a K through 12 graduate of the San Jose School Districts and live in my family home. Um, and uh, my father had a 40 acre orchard as I was growing up here in the Valley of Heart's Delight. Um, I went away to college and my first degree was in biology and then I did a masters in landscape architecture and uh, environmental planning at Berkeley. And um, I, I actually went in that direction from biology simply by seeing the, 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 how beautiful the cities in Europe were compared to this country. Um, so I, uh, I have um, had quite a few, some wonderful professional experiences one of them was that I helped Singapore create their garden city of Asia and um, was asked by the director of development, um, what can you do to help us start this program? And um, so I, what I said to him is I said, I wanna go into each department and, and start uh, looking at the details of what is happening in the, in, inside the different departments to uh, to change the the way things were were being done, and I said I wanted to start in the worst problem first, which was the boxy high rises, uh, which were the public housing, um, and try to get um, foundation plants and curves and balconies and things. We have this problem today here. Um, Anywhere, I have a, a 43 year old business called Secret Gardens. And um, so I've won a lot of awards, national and local awards and been published a lot. So that's been satisfying to see the changes. I think I've got the best uh, before and after pictures uh, of the work I've done on, on the internet. Um, so anyway, I, um, these, these, I've got a bunch of issues that I wanted to uh, kind of address that I don't think San Jose is addressing or thinking about in enough detail. Um, um, and they often, these ideas often cross multiple departments and need specialized leadership. Um, um, and, and Singapore, my experience in Singapore helps me uh, see uh, what needs to be done. Um, we should stop our the first one. Uh, we should stop the boxy high rises in San Jose. The top four is that these buildings should have setbacks. The buildings should all have balconies on every side, roof gardens, windows which open so fresh air from the San Francisco Bay can enter and people don't have to live with air conditioning. Um, we should, um, uh, never build high rises on a sidewalk without uh, street trees um, and foundation planting for them. Um, people should be allowed to have green around them, uh, even if they're working or living in, in these, these boxes. Um, and we're becoming a boxy city, I might add. Um, all tall buildings should have narrow trees. And one of the things we don't realize is that the horticulturists have developed special trees for this very purpose. They never come to San Jose. They're up in the Willamette Valley and they all, you know, these, these uh, researchers and they send them to the 
Midwest and the East Coast, but we don't get them here in, in California, and we should. Um, the gardens and creeks that we, that we have should attract birds, bees, butterflies, and healthy soil biology. Peaceful nature heals. Doctors today are recommending nature as a healer and a place to balance the technology world in our lives. There was a recent Silicon Valley Medical Foundation conference on this topic. There should be quiet places to sit and enjoy the birds, the bees, the butterflies. Um, nature resting places should be more than six, not be more than six blocks apart in our densest urban areas. There should be um, uh, plant plants for the for these birds, bees, and butterflies, and we need more certified wildlife habitats. Um, I have one uh, in my own garden. The walks along our rivers and creeks should be designed for pedestrians to jo enjoy nature, and instead, and and with benches. And, and instead, right now, we have bikers with straight walks, and they bike along and uh, control the experience. And I won't walk uh, with these bikers and, uh, and these very, um, to me, it's dangerous. Um, so we need to separate that, uh, you know, the, that kind of thing along the, along the creeks. Um, there, there should be moving water sounds, waterfalls and pal, ponds in our urban parks and plazas, and we rarely have it. Even small spaces with high rises around them could have a wall fountain with shade trees and comfortable uh, seating, uh, like Paley Park in New York City has one of those. Everyone, Everywhere our soil should have healthy soil biology, biology to break up the clay pan soil, which currently dominates our valley. In one handful of healthy soil, there should be more alive organisms and people in the world. With, with this healthy soil, plants will need 40% less water, will need less maintenance, and the, the, the biology will feed uh, and improve the plants, aerate the soil, and it will make them healthier, even, even the food that we grow. And the soil biology will sequester carbon, thus reducing global warming. Um, the organized organisms in the soil are our soils worker bees. San Jose should support creating the business of healthy soil bi biology for our city land and residents. This is a business which could be popular everywhere here. If there are lawns, the grass should be low water, native fescue grasses, which dominated our valley before Europeans arrived and didn't need irrigated, to be irrigated. This was fescue grass, and it does not need to be mowed regularly, and needs little watering. It, <clears throat> if possible, create meadows, meadows like our valley um, was before Europeans arrived. And in some areas, we could mow, and some places not mow the grass. And I've seen this done in European parks, and it, it, it's just lovely. Trees which canopy over concrete streets will reduce heat and glare and gasoline smells, clean the air, and thus reduce global warming. Currently, in many parts of San Jose, the wrong tree shape has been planted on our streets, or there are no street trees. And in one in particular, the one that bothers me the most are the palm trees, and I'll talk about that later. Um, Let's try to return San Jose to its original garden city theme, Valley of Hearts Delight. Whenever possible, use permeable concrete for our curbs and parking strips to, so water goes directly into the groundwater, stays on site, is cleaned on site, does not move far from where it landed, 
and long term is a less expensive way to get water to our water table. Make buildings as sustainable as possible using solar panels, recycled water, rain collection, and uh, on, on roofs. This is especially important for high rises and commercial complexes. San Jose needs to stop planting palms, redwoods, and eucalyptus trees, which all create maintenance problems. Palm trees are dense uh, with roots and uh, in their roots, and therefore do not allow other plants to grow easily around them. They also do not provide food and homes for our native animals. Also, they are expensive to maintain because they do not grow well in cold winters and thus create dead fronds, which, which need winter in the winter, which need um, expensive uh, pruning every year. Redwoods are native to creeks in our coastal mountains and have shallow roots and need a lot of water to look healthy. They should never be planted in lines as we see them on our roads and freeways and parks, but only as specimen trees. Eucalyptus trees are not native and have a tannin in their leaves, which kill our soils. So native plants will not grow under or around them. And the, then what happens is the eucalyptus do, begins to dominate and be the only plant that then grows there. Um, there's an island in, in, uh, in San Francisco Bay that, that was dominated by a state park by the eucalyptus trees and they took them all out for this very reason. It would be wise to request our state freeways and county plant, um, expressways to stop, to ask them to stop planting these species in San Jose. San Jose needs to plant canopy trees which gives shade to all the concrete on our streets and sidewalks. It needs to plant new street trees in a more sustainable way with a live organisms, soil, and deep water bubbler systems to encourage their roots to grow deeper more quickly. When these tree roots are deep, they will then be able to get the water from our high water table. Priority for street trees should be along public transit routes and where riders wait to use public transit. And I certainly don't see that happening on the street that I live closest to, which is San Carlos. The edges of San Jose adjacent to wild areas need to be protected from fire, both on public and private land. Um, some ideas to reduce fire are plant plants around property lines, which do not burn. Build bur buildings uh, made out of hemp materials. Hemp does not burn and hemp roofs would be great to start with. They would stop that, uh, that uh, strong heat, which seems to be pushing that heat in, in our California fires. Keep plants healthy and needing less water with a live or organic compost. Collect water from roofs into 5,000 gallon rainwater barrels. You should know that our average rain, we're not talking about last year, but the average rain for average roof in San Jose will collect 25,000 gallons of water a year. Hemp building materials are not grown in um, the western part of, of the United States. And San Jose could begin encouraging the growing and manufacturing of hemp building materials, as hemp is greatly needed to reduce our western fires, which are a major source of our global warming problem. San Jose could lead the way in helping stop our state's huge fires and may make money doing it. San Jose needs a botanical garden where citizens and professionals can be educated about nature and how to reduce our global warming problems. It could have the only horticulture and environmental library in Silicon Valley and be a place to bring international speakers and thinkers. 
currently the top 30 U.S. cities in population all have a botanical garden, except number 10, which is unfortunately San Jose. Even the large universities and junior colleges in our city and county have nowhere on their campus to educate their students about plants and nature in the urban environment. I use my certified wildlife habitat garden to give tours and educate people interested in the right plants for attracting birds, bees, butterflies, and, 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 and how to do healthy soil biology. San Jose needs more public and private certified wildlife habitats. As you review these ideas, I, I believe it will become clear that San Jose has a long way to go to improve the way we perform to help reduce global warming. And we could become a good example. Clearly, we need to have a better way to allow the above ideas and more uh, to help to move forward and change our city to be a healthier, climate smart city and county. Um, and then I wanted to read um, something about um, what the proposal is and why you are so important. Ms. Matheson, I'd ask you to make it brief because we're uh, running out on our time. So Okay, I'm sorry. It's okay. Uh, well, as you can see that these are ideas that are missing in, in our, so Councilman Jimenez and Chabby Jones on 10 21 will ask for a vote of city council on 11 21 to vote against letting the charter review commission discuss climate as a topic on the grounds that it would be redundant with city programs. A subcommittee of this climate Charter Review Commission is presented this on 11 one 21 and it will be voted on a week later. The argument of council members Jimenez and Jones is that since the city has a climate smart program that no more input is needed regarding climate mitigation. The timing appears to block the vote. All programs are only on policy level, and this proposed commission is on charter level and is exclusively made up of non employees of San Jose. So it does not duplicate the work of the city that the city is doing as council members, Jimenez and Jones argue. I think that's enough. I think you got the idea, I hope. <laughs> Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Uh, questions from commissioners? Mr. Siegel. I just wanted to thank you, um, Ms. Matthewson, for your time tonight and also for your garden that's you know on your private property, but that you're using as an example to educate San Jose because we don't have a public um, comparable garden and system that can educate us on which plant species um, are, are best, are more local, which grasses we should plant, and how to, um, how to plant things that, that are actually food for our native wildlife. So thank you so much for doing that on your own private property and for encouraging our city to, to do that for the public. Um, I, I just wanted to say that you are an example of somebody who um, could be on a commission that we're proposing and that you bring your unique background, which is um, which has to do with the, um, uh, I, I'm losing my words here, planning. Um, oh, what's the term? Urban planning. Urban planning, yes, urban planning, which has to do with soils and buildings and plants. Um, but I just wanna say thank you so much for being an example. I think we have such a diverse, um, population that has so many different backgrounds that having a commission like the one we're proposing will have people on it that will come from very diverse backgrounds, but all related to climate. And so thank you for showing us that somebody with an urban planning background could bring 
that many ideas to the table. So thank you so much. And thank you also to our other wonderful speaker who um, has taught us how um, a person can actually reduce the carbon footprint, not only of oneself, but equivalent to, I think you said 26 cars a year, something like that, that was truly amazing. So thank you so much to both of you. Seeing no other questions, I wanna uh, join Commissioner Siegel in saying thank you both to our guests tonight. And I'm gonna move us to our public comment. Um, and so the city clerk can call this first speaker on um, the, from the public. Mr. Chairman, I think you have someone from the commission. Oh. I'm sorry. Commissioner Fuentes, I'm sorry. You, you were in the green grass there. It's hard to see your <laughs> hand sometimes. So yeah, I need, thank you. Um, well, first of all, um, I wanted to thank um, um, Meredith Mueller and Catherine uh, Mathewson for coming to our meeting and um, for your life's work and for everything that you you shared with us. Um, truly inspiring and you know truly I mean full of answers and you know I don't think anyone who's here present today can deny the um, the the, the uh, condition of our planet. And the fact that we need to 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 look for the solutions and provide leadership um, to make the changes we need. So I really want to thank you for being here and for everything that you've done. And um, but I also before we go into public speakers, um, I also want to comment, uh, Sheriff Ferreira and commissioners. Um, it's been spoken about the letter that has been presented um, by. Um, Vice, uh, Vice Mayor Jones and also um, Council Member um, Jimenez. And that has a, a um, direct impact on our work. And so um, I am trying to, I mean, it's not on the agenda to discuss it. I understand that, but um, um, what are we gonna do? I mean, are we going to, um, individually go and express our concern or so I'm gonna, yeah, I, I'm, yeah, I know I'm out of order, but what are, yeah, what are let's, let's finish this? our public agenda. And then I'm going to ask the city clerk, um, just to render her opinion. We, it is not on the agenda, so it's not a topic we can have a discussion about or take action on. So I'll go to the clerk after we go to public comment, but, uh, the public's been waiting for a long time to be able to comment on the study session. So I wanna to go to that first um, and then we'll come back to the city clerk uh, before we adjourn. City clerk, if you could call the first speaker and thank the public for their patience this evening. Tessa Wood, Nancy. Oh. oh, I just wanted to thank the commission for the wonderful meeting. And it was so interesting to listen to the person who does the uh, auditing because I, you know, as we look into our climate crisis, and we're proposing a, a, a similar type of process to evaluate um, our our carbon footprint and in all of the departments as we go forward. And so it's so interesting to listen to his auditing and how you know they're really doing that on a different level, looking economics or different things that they're looking at. But we need to um, focus our attentions on our climate crisis. Um, because of its urgency um, and going forward. And the issue of, uh, you know, just really appreciated the, the speakers tonight talking about the climate crisis and, and really appreciate um, uh, our, our um, Magnolia Siegel for her, her, ad, you know, her, her tenacity to really work on this and all the speakers that this third commission, uh, the third leg, the people's agenda addressed were just amazingly helpful. And so, you know, when, right, and then, and as we are faced with this challenge that our, our politicians are giving us and saying, no, we don't want this, it's very annoying to me because one thing we learned um, that I've learned so much from this Charter Commission, um, one of the things that somebody spoke about was the, the commissions itself, that it came from the grassroots. 
and how we could have a grant. We needed the people's agenda and the people talking. That's what commissions were about. And for our council people or our city manager to be, you know, p putting their will into this is wrong. And we shouldn't be addressed. They shouldn't be addressing. They could be a, a citizen like the rest of us. But to s use their power to, to squelch this, this dialogue is wrong. And this was this was the vision of the, the commission was to get the public's input, to get the public involved. And so hopefully we can, you know, resist this and, you know, take these seriously. Alina Yin. Thank you, commissioners. Um, it was a really lovely presentation. And I learned so much from so many different topics. And two minutes doesn't really cover it, but I'm going to try and breeze through some things that I feel that are really important about this letter from um, Councilmember Jones and Jimenez having to do with climate and police. And I know that there has been mention of dupl duplicity um, in efforts and whatnot, but I feel that as other uh, speakers have addressed that that's not actually the case. And also what I feel that they are failing to see is what collaboration, accountability, inclusion and equity looks like in the process. You know, these are community led bodies by everyday residents like you and I here. And we're not working in a silo, but in respect to each other with, um, you know, the real community. I'm sorry, the, the reimagining public safety. And, you know, part of inclusion means actually including more voices beyond the status quo, beyond the bare minimum. Our community is coming together and we're working together to address, you know, community harm from climate and police. And, you know, um, by attending these meetings and by writing letters and providing public comment, by joining the very process of legislation on these boards and commissions, and we're doing everything that we have been instructed to do. And now um, we've been following the rules and now all of a sudden the rules are changing one month before this commission is supposed to finish their work. And, you know, to council members, Jones and Jimenez, I feel like, you know, let this, commission, uh, let this commission finish our work. And as Meredith Mueller so eloquently put it, you know, part of this process is that they no longer have the authority to, to cease to ignore their constituents. We are coming together, we're working together, and we have a right to discuss these um, issues that our community cares about and we've been showing up for. And this is really important. And so I hope that the commission is able to respond, whether a letter or some sort of response. Sarah Beekman. Hi, um, I, uh, to thank you for this item tonight and for people's words. Thank you for the words of the previous speaker. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm writing letters on the subject of how to keep uh, this process going. Uh, Thank you. Uh, to, to offer a few comments about the city auditor, I thank you. Uh, there's ways that he can, uh, each month at Rules and Open Government, he offers a, uh, an audit report of, of, of several dozen, of a dozens of items within city government that he's working on that I think uh, it, it offers a great idea of accessibility. Um, uh, there's the, thanks for the uh, person from LA to talk about uh, you know, oversight issues with policing. And for the uh, speaker who works with William Armelane in San Jose, you know, I have a simple question to ask. Uh, is uh, the City Charter Commission still in charge of creating a legal language if uh, a, a community police oversight is created uh, for uh, the, the election process? Um, if you're still in charge of that in some way for the legal language, that means you have to be talking about reimagine questions still. So I'm a, I'm a bit disappointed with you know all the ideas of affordable housing and how it can talk about green sustainability, neighborhood equity, and Ohlone issues. Uh, there's a lot of things we can talk about in through to uh, you know early uh, January 2022, um, and that can really very much help give a focus to the upcoming equity roundtable ideas and the uh, COVID uh, 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 commission that's gonna be taking place also, uh, economic forum. So, um, you know, I, I, I hope that you can continue your work and we can ask for an extension just as a study process to help focus ourselves for 2022. Back to the chair. Thank you, I'll now call for public comment on items that are not on the agenda. The clerk can call for first speaker. Tessa Woodmancy. Oh, 
Oh, thank you so much, Chair, for for giving us this this opportunity to talk to things that are not on the agenda. Um, I guess basically, you know, how we're going to, I guess, you know, go forward with our, I mean, I guess our climate crisis is, is on the agenda, so I'm not supposed to talk about it, but it's the only thing we're supposed to talk about when we have a crisis. And, you know, um, it's just, uh, I guess, the issue of how we go forward when, you know, the the politicians and even our, we had the same thing we came up with with the general manager trying to abort the uh, police agenda issue um, and saying it was redundant. And, and the irony of it is that it's truly not redundant. First of all, I could never even find the, this, the thing about, you know, the safety, whatever that, the reimagining. It's not even on the, the clerk's uh, list. The way, and then supposedly it was in the, the city managers, um, you know, I had to go there. And then they have this terrible thing on the website, jump, jump to this or something, you know, something that's hidden in their website. So what I'm saying is the public outreach you know, is not good. The website, you know, in terms of our, you know, reimagining to police, and they gave us the same argument saying that was redundant. And the thing with our climate crisis is that what we are needing to do is just like with the um, uh, uh, auditing is to really be able to expose where our fossil fuels, we have to bring it to zero is what the, the science says. We have to do that by really as soon as possible, 2030, what we experienced last night with our, you know, the, 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 um, the, the, the crisis that we had with our flooding, this, this is all part of climate crisis. And the, the, you know, we are, we're experiencing it right now in the Bay area. And, and um, so we have to move on this and, you know, that's, that's what we need to be doing. And that, that's the, the thing we're talking about is the accountability. And though they say they have a climate plan, we know nothing about it. It needs to be exposed. Claire Beekman. Hi, thank you. Blair Beekman here. Since we had eight really good speakers tonight, uh, I, maybe you could have uh, split the public comment time after four of the public speakers and uh, after the four sections or whatever, and, uh, you know, somewhere halfway in the middle there. And, uh, yeah, there was a lot uh, that happened tonight, so thank you. Um, I was uh, to first speak about, uh, to continue, uh, how we can work on the future of, uh, you know, possibly continuing the city charter process some parts of it into you know maybe february or march i think if we can do that we can have a better discussion uh maybe we can focus it on issues say around affordable housing and let that be a starting point to simply have a focused dialogue of, of you know the, all the issues around affordable housing like green sustainability uh neighborhood equity uh some concepts of reimagine and and ohlone uh issues um, I think that we can manage that. And I think it, to, to offer that sort of study session and focus, if nothing else, can give a great direction to there's three really important commissions coming up, you know, that I mentioned earlier, including the uh, reimagine uh, task force things, you know, that's really, uh, we can add and contribute a lot. And I think it's something to work for. The person of, uh, who spoke about green sustainability issues, she did amazing to talk about the importance of, of what uh, Chappie Jones will not be talking about and uh, you know what is not being addressed. And so things are not redundant. Uh, good luck in how you can work on these things. And I think we can have a good study session process. I hope the subcommittee uh, process for uh, the, all these upcoming commissions, we were really locked in and tight and were not allowed any public access. I think we can much improve that after the VTA issues, you know, made us all cold. I think we can open up better and warm up now. Um, thank you for the uh, all the support. Alina. Thank you, commissioners. Um, I just want to echo what Tessa and Blair has said before. You know, thankfully, the people of San Jose seem to understand better than their elected officials that many hands make for light work and right all that rising tides should lift all boats. Council, I feel, should be rejoiced and supportive rather than divisive of our efforts and using censorship tactics to remove our constitutional right to discuss these items. Under the California Constitution, Article 1, Section 3, the people have the right to instruct the representatives, petition government for redress of grievances, which there are many, and assemble freely to consult for the common good. 
And that's what we're doing. We're following the rules and we are trying to work with as many different communities and community organizations as possible. And I think that work should be supported rather than deterred or shut down. And I feel that there is opportunity for the commission, I know it's not on the agenda, but to discuss whether it be a letter that is voted and written and sent to the commission, or if people are speaking at the rules and open committee, I think it's this 27th <clears throat> of um, this week on Wednesday. And um, I also like to comment on the presentation about AI. I thought that the suggestions and um, what was shared by Dr. Quill was very um, impactful and it shows a lot that we, we have a lot to address. Maybe there should be a civic GovTech commission and um, also on some of the, the data that was shared in the policing um, presentation by Micah, I am very surprised to, to hear that SJPD is one of the most you know fatal encounters of all PDs and I think that just all the more reason why we should be discussing this, all the more reason why people are showing up and wanting these discussions so that they can create solutions together. Back to the chair. Um, thank you. Thank you members of the public for being with us for this long study session. Um, I'm gonna ask the city clerk this, the item of the memo coming from the vice mayor is not on the agenda, so we are not gonna discuss it. Um, but city clerk, could you just give your um, advice in terms of any procedures that individual commissioners can take? Um, yes, the com commissioners can attend the rules meeting. It begins at two o'clock on Zoom. So you can find the link on the agenda and you can speak as, as an individual. Um, you can say for the commission, but that you need to specify you're not speaking on behalf of the commission. Um, and then you can talk about it at rules and should it be passed from rules to the city council meeting, you can also um, attend the city council meeting and speak to it there as well. And again, just, just specify you're speaking on your own behalf, not on behalf of the commission. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna adjourn us then um, to this commission um, for tonight. Um, thank everyone for their service and being um, so attentive this evening and your great questions. Thank you to the public for joining us. Um, and we're adjourned till November 1st uh, at 5.30 for our next virtual meeting. Thank you all. I think there's a hand up. Um, Commissioner Fuentes? Um, there's a problem here. Um, this, the timing of this letter was such that we could not even discuss it, the very subject of this letter. Um, what can we do? Can we have a special meeting? Um, can we, I guess you're saying the only thing we can do is to individually attend the meeting at this point, correct? That's the direction of the city clerk, that is correct. Um, Chair, what about item four, which has to do with the meeting schedule? I think this memo addresses the meeting schedule. It potentially impacts it. Wouldn't that be a way that we could talk about it? No. Notice? No. No, I, and the I, schedule is more to, to, to say when our next meeting is. Right. We're actually going to discuss the meeting That's, schedule. We need to have recommendation language on there. Right. This is a study session. schedule and agenda items is there. So you guys can tell us we would like to add like next week. Can we talk about this? Or, um, you know, our next meeting is Thursday. Our next meeting is Monday. It's really not a discussion item, but we can add discussion items to that header. That's like a normal default header. But you know, we, we have headers throughout the agenda that we don't necessarily use every week. Commissioner Fuentes, are you asking for it to be added for into the next session? I think we definitely should add it to the next meeting. I, I I've already I've already thought of that, but I need to check with Mark because the agenda has to post today, had to post today. Um, but let me check with Mark and see if we can get that added um, a day late. Um, there, there's a couple alternatives to how we can add it for discussion for next Monday. Um, I'm really trying not to have a discussion here. So I'm gonna call on commissioners that have their hands raised, but we, we are not gonna be discussing. 
the clerk has given us directions. Yeah, I actually just got a text from the attorney who was saying, you know, don't talk about this. Long. City Attorney Danny, do you want to give your opinion in public, please? Yes, I can. Uh, yeah, as the clerk mentioned, it's it's not on the agenda. Um, the public hasn't been given proper notice of the item, and so it shouldn't be discussed at this meeting, and we'll evaluate whether or not it can be added to the future agenda for next week. Okay, so on that count, I'm going to adjourn us to our November 1st meeting um, in accordance with the direction of the city attorney, uh, and thank you all for your service tonight. And I'll work with the city staff to see what we can do to add to the, um, if we can amend the agenda for November 1st. Thank you.